Good evening. I will call the meeting of the Select Board uh, to order at 6.33 p.m. on Monday, August 13th. Uh, we'll begin our agenda with opening remarks, announcements, and agenda review. I'll, I'll begin with some, uh, uh, an opening remark here before we get into just double checking our agenda and that sort of thing. And so the last time we met, which was three weeks ago, uh, we had a conversation fairly late in the evening regarding uh, the current status of PBA, PVTA and funding. Um, and well, quite frankly, I was wrong. I was mistaken in, in under, my understanding of what uh, was the situation with regard to PVTA and the, the routes that are currently um, being offered and, and changes to those routes relative to the fiscal year 19 funding availability. So I had had a conversation a couple days after the House and Senate compromise bill had been passed. The governor hadn't even signed it yet <clears throat> with the administrator of PVTA. And I just mistook what she said to say that the, the, the uh, routes would be, you know, the, the funding looked as though it was sufficiently available to, to cover things and we'd have to reevaluate in a few months. Um, the reality is, is that there's, uh, there's still a, a fair high level of confidence in, in being able to fund most of the gap that exists in the PBTA budget, but it won't be all, and so there will be likely cuts uh, put into place in uh, the beginning of September. However, um, town meeting appropriated an initial $53,000 or so for the purpose of, of restoring uh, some cuts to roots within our, within our town. Um, and according to my conversation late on Friday, which was brief again with the administrator, um, we have some opportunity to, to, to mitigate those, those cuts a little bit by virtue of uh, the fact that not all of them will kick in right away. In other words, when they affect ridership is, is not necessarily immediate or not as noticeable. Uh, and so we will, we will look into that in a more uh, in-depth way than we have to date. Um, there is a public meeting of the, uh, at the Bank Center tomorrow at four o'clock to six o'clock. The primary purpose of that is to get feedback and, and uh, commentary on changes to uh, some of their policies relative to when they make changes. What, is, you know, what level of change requires public hearing process, uh, what are the kinds of changes and, and uh, disproportionate and disparate effects that, that uh, need to be considered and mitigated when, when they make uh, significant changes to the roots, um, both in a positive and negative direction. So it's, it's uh, part of the regular uh, process to have this conversation about, about those uh, standards they use for, for evaluating uh, disproportionate disparate effects and what constitutes a major change. Um, and so uh, that's a, a you know, natural three-year process. The, the feds have you go back and relook at those policies. And if you choose to, to uh, change them in any way, you do, you do need to have public hearing process. However, um, they also uh, will give an update on, on the budget and where the root changes are, are taking effect and what um, uh, is the current circumstance of, of the uh, upcoming uh, budget and fiscal year. Um, we would have normally noticed that out to everybody a little earlier than the day before, uh, but they typically send those notifications from the PBTA to the town clerk, and as you guys are well aware, we had a town clerk that was on duty until most of the end of, most of June, but not all the way to the end of June. Then we had an interim for the month of July, and we have a new clerk starting in August. And so I think in that overlap of folks, that email that sent, gets sent with those notices probably is sitting in an inbox that's not being attended to. So an apology to the public regarding not having better notice on that public hearing process. Um, and there are some others uh, available, but certainly tomorrow is the one that's in town. If people want to hear about how uh, the PVTA goes about its process of understanding uh, how changes affect and how uh, they then mitigate uh, those changes if they, if they need to. So that's an announcement about uh, where we are on that. Um, but I wanted to get that out early. Our agenda is fairly lengthy tonight, so I want to make sure to get that sort of at the front of the meeting um, and, and put that out there so we can have conversations about that uh, in the coming weeks. The PBTA Advisory Board meets next Tuesday, I believe, the 22nd. Um, and so given our conversations tonight, perhaps later, and certainly uh, my conversations with the folks at PBTA in the, uh, tomorrow afternoon and, and uh, what I hear at the public hearing as well, um, That'll inform you know what I what I bring to that advisory board meeting on Tuesday, um, 
And so I'll keep you as select board members informed about what our options are uh, and what actions we might take relative to those, those uh, changes in service in our town. Um, other things on our agenda that I want to mention, we have a, a number of folks visiting us this evening, so we'll probably take things not strictly in order, which is often the case, um, just to be conscientious of their time and the fact that they've come early. Um, and we do have formal uh, public hearings on parking changes, so we will take that up at 7 o'clock. Are there other changes or announcements to the agenda? Not any that we hear. All right. So we'll start with public comment. I know there are a number of people that, that might be here for public comment for items not on our agenda, uh, which is perfectly fine. If it's for an item on the agenda, I'll have you hold off on those until we get to that agenda item. But if you have comment on other things, uh, you're welcome to come forward and we'll take them in turn. Uh, we'll try to limit our remarks to about three minutes or so. And uh, we generally don't respond. So we'll take the, the information in, um, we'll make notes on it, and potentially take it up at another time. So who is here for public comment, not on an agenda item? One, two, three. All right, let's start with you. Step to the mic, announce your name is the usual process. And uh, Vince O'Connor, Summer Street, uh, Precinct 1, town meeting member. Um, so I would uh, like to open, I have three short comments. One is uh, referring the select board to a comment I made at town meeting uh, and actually a question I asked regarding the economic development director as to whether he had prepared any plans or strategy in dealing with the opening of the MGM casino. I if the board has not seen the signs, I have been heard from numbers of people who have that MGM plans to provide free bus service from Amherst and various locations in Amherst to their casino in Springfield. And um, I would just say that um, it is now time to prepare a plan because, um, and when I spoke to Mr. Kravitz at town meeting outside in the hallway, Mr. Kravitz did not seem to be aware of the fact that the casinos in, Spring in uh, Connecticut had for years been providing free bus uh, rides from both Western Massachusetts and New York. In fact, I had a friend who used to commute from, uh, from Boston to New York via, via the uh, free bus service to the casinos. And so you, if you don't have a plan, you are going to watch many uh, people with uh, dis uh, significant disposable income spending their leisure time in Springfield. And uh, I really suggest that you, you formulate a plan and maybe have some initial thoughts uh, by next week because the weekend um, of the first services that will f f impact the town is, is, will be the last weekend in August, first weekend in September. Uh, second, um, uh, my comments are about the Puffers Pond Dyke. I read the article in the Gazette. Um, I, I can tell you right now that the assurances that were provided by the assistant town manager um, were completely inaccurate um, and totally inaccurate. My understanding from a very well-informed source is that um, the individual on whose property the dike rests has been in absolutely intransigent and um, with regard to allowing the town to perform any activities that would ameliorate the conditions that were identified by the commissioner of, dam, uh, of the Office of Dam Safety. I live not many hundreds of feet downstream, directly downstream from that, as do many of my neighbors and so forth. I do not appreciate the comments of the uh, assistant town manager in regard to the fact that the town was doing something which it was not doing. Oh, and so Mr. I, Chair, um, yes, please. I'm, I'm really having trouble with remarks being made about our personnel. This is the second one now. And I, I really think that is outside of the bounds of public comment. And I, I turn it to you to make that decision. So I, okay. I will just well, I, I'll tell you, I I'll, I'll wait, please. I, I order the meeting here. Uh, so just wait. What I will suggest is try to refer those comments. If, if it's a personal matter, you should refer to the it's town manager for those. Matter. It is, because no, it's no, about it the performance of staff. In the newspaper. If this was a personnel camera com matter, it would be an issue um, that was private in the personnel file. This was a public comment. Those comments, I have 
that the individual, the, the comments were made are inaccurate. The town has not done anything because the property owner is intransigent. And, and my view as a resident of the area who could be directly affected is that the town needs to essentially step up to the plate and tell the property owner that if he does not cooperate, then, then shortly thereafter, either the town meeting or the city council will be called into action to deal appropriately with the need for the town to complete the series of actions that were required of the town by the commissioner of the Office of Dam Safety. Right, hold on, okay? just before you go to the third point. Just try, as you refer to staff members, please, not to... I, I referred to nobody by name. I referred to the assistant Stand town that. manager. There's only one of those, so it's oh, right. a known person. I'm, look, but I'm sorry, I'd, but... I'd like you to just keep the comments to the facts of the matter I didn't make the comment the in the and newspaper. Not the opinions of the matter. I didn't. All I said was the comments were inaccurate based on the information that I received today, and quite frankly, um, the, the property owner in question is intransigent. He has not allowed the town on the property. He has not allowed town to do anything and th that situation needs to be dealt with. We, none of you live downstream from that, that dike. I do, and I don't appreciate hearing in the newspaper assurances that turned out not to be accurate. So finally, I just want to say that the, the approval of the Spring Street project um, has, um, has, I think, brought to all the corners of the town the odor of corruption that exists between the planning board this is really and, and, the, and the archipelago organization. You can leave. You don't have to listen. <laughs> but quite frankly, it is, it is getting to the point where people who ordinarily do not find it offensive <laughs> pay attention to town activities and so forth are, f are finding it extraordinarily offensive as to what has gone on. And I think that this board is the one that approves and has put the planning board in place. And quite frankly, I think there is a problem here. And there was substantial public comment. There were reasonable concerns and none of them were dealt with. This, is, this has got to stop. And, you know, and it's just got to stop. And if it doesn't stop, there are going to be problems that are going to be much more significant than my comments at this table. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Lee. Excuse me. Please leave. Yeah, well, the level of inappropriateness is the planning board's corrupt practices with regard to our That's Colorado. absolutely libelous. Yeah, libel, libel, truth is the defense, is an absolute defense. Well, I need to Mr. O'Connor, Mr. O'Connor, please, you've had your public comment. I'm Jeff Lee, I live on Southeast Street, and my main purpose for coming here is really just to make the select board and the listening audience aware of the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority meeting that uh, Mr. Slaughter has already um, announced. I appreciate that. I will point out that the cuts are not insignificant. Every route that passes through Amherst except for the R29 to Holyoke and the 35 cam campus shuttle are being affected. So I hope members of the select board and other uh, Amherst citizens will join me tomorrow uh, and advocate for public transportation in Amherst and attend the uh, PVTA session. Four o'clock in the Bank Center. Appreciate that. You're on. <laughs> the Ann Whalen. Uh, I wanted to thank Williams and Wilson for their willingness to redesign the building going up within a few weeks or months uh, behind the Mason's Lodge. 
uh, to accommodate the trees, uh, which are still standing. And I wondered if it might not be possible to uh, initiate some board or committee or a group of small group of concerned citizens to discuss the possibility of refraining from putting up further five-story buildings on this side of Maine and Amity, uh, keep them all uh, on the uh, Kendrick Park side as opposed to the uh, Sweetser Park side. Uh, that's it. Thank you. There, sorry. Just yes. to, I just I just have a question based on your earlier report about the PBTA meeting tomorrow. Are you going to? I know you mentioned that you'll be going, of course, as you have a seat on the advisory board. That you'll be going to that next <coughs> week. But are you going to be able to attend tomorrow on our behalf? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I thought I heard you say that, but yes. I wanted to be sure. Yes, I will be. Thank there. you. I appreciate that because I had not put it in my schedule. So thank you. And secondly, I know that we obviously have had any number of transitions, but. It seems weird to me that PVTA would depend on sending things to the town clerk that are not public 48-hour things because that's not what those are and just expect magically the town clerk to just do things. That probably works in towns where they have three hours a week of a town clerk that doesn't do 50 million other things, but I, I don't really understand that. So I would hope that you could encourage them to copy you on it since you have a seat at the table right. and then you'd be sitting with the town manager and the town manager's right. assistant and then it would actually get to people. Well, it just seems like an odd way to hope that things go places. So I think they officially noticed the clerks, but I think they've also traditionally noticed the executive assistant of the town manager, which also changed over. Right, and that could <laughs> be us. too. And I knew about the meeting, you know, when, we, when the advisory board last met, um, they mentioned the meetings. And I thought, oh, they'll send us a notice, because they always do. Right. Which I then, of course, didn't recall the specific dates and realize, and they sure. snuck up on us. And so unfortunately, we don't have as much lead time on that as we'd usually like to have, because we usually like to put it on the scroll of the right. exactly. website, all of those sort of things. So hopefully people, there are, um, I believe, a couple more after tomorrow, later in the week. So there are. Um, there any one in Springfield? I think the Northampton one is either the 15th or 16th. Do you know offhand? One more in Hoyo. One more in Hoyo? Is that it? Okay. So, but they're talking about the same thing in all of them, and they're really seeking public feedback. So I, I will probably go and listen and observe, probably won't offer comment at that point because I get my opportunities in other places. Um, but certainly I'll, I'll uh, engage the staff sort of, you know, sort of outside the meeting to, to, to talk to them about the route changes in our town and, and uh, listen to what the folks that are there have to say about about those as well as um, about the changes to the policy which is the, the primary focus of the meeting but not the entirety of it yes um, I know you're our representative and I'm sure you'll bring up the outreach issue but would it be um, helpful to reinforce that with a, a, a letter from this board um, commenting on how important this is to our community and that um, where they really should be sending that and to make sure that that doesn't happen again You know that too. Yeah, Mr. Slaughter. Yes. Um, when you reference used the word policies, was that in reference to um, the bus fares being charged? There's there are other it's more than routes because that was a distinction. For right. Routes. So so currently, um, uh, if the percentage change in that is being made is more than twenty percent. Uh, it's considered a major change. So that's one, that percentage um, is one of those pieces that's being under discussion for, for change. Um, I think that for the, uh, I read this and now I don't recall the details now, there's disparate and disproportionate. One of those is changing, one of them isn't, but it's being separated is part of it. Some of it's more about the details of how to lay those things out in a distinct way so that they can be, um, articulated more clearly than they have in the past. Um, but uh, changes to fares would be something that would also fall under that. So if it was more than a, uh, a 
I think they're going from 20 to 25 is the, is the recommendation. Um, so fares would be considered in, in that change as well as far as that impact and whether or not they need a full public hearing process for that. Oh, sorry. I can turn. I can turn. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I think we'll go down to section <coughs> seven of our, of our uh, agenda, which has licenses, public way, and meter parking reservations, because we have three items that have to do with um, folks that are visiting us today. So um, I think we'll take them uh, in no particular order. We'll take uh, the Amherst College question first, which if you'd like to come to the microphone and tell us a little bit about. We, we often do some of these sorts of things under our consent calendar in, in our case tonight. Uh, this is a little different circumstance, and so we want to have an opportunity to chat with you about it a little bit. Um, this is under 7C, which is special wine and malt license, Amherst College for recurring pub nights on Student Campus Center on three nights in September, three nights, well, two different weekends, oh no, excuse me, three different sets of dates in September. So why don't you sort of paint the picture for us, we'll probably ask you a series of questions and then we'll see where we're at. So introduce yourselves at the microphone first so we know who you are for the TV audience. My name is Paul Gallegos, I'm Director of Student Activities at Amherst College. And I'm Joe Flugiger, I'm the Director of Dining at Amherst College and also an Amherst resident. Great. And, um, I actually uh, uh, was uh, given a list of questions uh, to prepare for this, and so I actually have a small packet for each of the select board members if, uh, if you would like that. Why don't you hand it to Mr. Steinberg here, okay. and then he'll dole them out, or, or Ms. Kruger. I do. <laughs> That's right. I think there's enough yeah. for everybody. Um, Good so I'll, uh, I, don't, I don't want to take too much of your time, um, but uh, the intention of these pub nights um, is to establish a place on campus where we can model positive drinking culture. And uh, so what we're trying to do is create a comfortable but responsible space that will be supervised uh, where we can have light programming and uh, encourage students who are of age uh, to consume alcohol responsibly. And so uh, the um, design here is, uh, if you look on the second page, it's in the campus center, which is called Keef. Uh, on the third page, you can see the first floor uh, layout um, with the exits marked and on the fourth page you can see the actual pub space again with the exits laid out. Um, we did uh, actually today have uh, training for um, all of the on-site staff and personnel that would uh, be supervising the space. Um, the tips training and uh, everybody was certified today. Um, we've identified three days a week uh, in, the, in the beginning, and then if, you know, provided, well, we actually are in the process right now of seeking a permanent uh, beer and wine license, um, but it's a lengthy process, as you know. Um, so we're in the process of uh, getting the documents for the deed and uh, establishing the warrant uh, to uh, advertise to the community, as well as um, informing uh, our butters and uh, other legal matters that re are required as part of the process. Right. So does the board have questions for <coughs> our applicants as they scan through the document? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Go ahead, Mr. Steinberg. I appreciate the statement that your part of the purpose is to uh, teach responsible drinking. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment in a different way, but uh, this is a, uh, for, for uh, um, when you're saying uh, tw age 21 checks, is the checking happening by the bartender, I gather, not on entrance to the um, event so that students that are under the age of 21 could come into the event. That is true, yes. So what is the mechanism for making sure that 19-year-old um, me doesn't go to my friend who happens to be 21 and say, hey, could you get some, uh, get a drink and then 
give it to me. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as you probably all well know, uh, the population over at uh, Amherst is 1,850 students. Um, so it's not, not onerous in terms of uh, observing and trying to monitor and supervise that space. So we do have people that will be in the space that will be able to observe what's happening and address that uh, situation as it arises. We hope that um, students, as it's explained, and hopefully they'll, they'll appreciate and that the benefits of the space and that, you know, have we, you know, as those issues arise, we can articulate that in a way where either we have to invite them to leave or, you know, we, we encourage them to act appropriately. That's, you know, we're, we're trying to create a space that's both comfortable but also educational. So it's, uh, um, there's actually a, a, a few other uh, places around the country that have done this successfully, and I, I was at a conference recently where uh, somebody spoke uh, eloquently about how they engage with students in a way that really uh, helped them appreciate that the benefits of having a place like this on campus um, without it being um, adversarial. So I think that was, uh, we learned a lot from that experience. Um. I don't know if any of my colleagues will have other questions along those lines, but I was going to, um, the other thing I've been wondering about with Amherst Colleges is that we've been working with the university for a number of years now on campus and community coalition to address problem drinking. And uh, the uh, process, because I'm a member of the um, coalition and the regularly attend the meetings, has been an excellent combination of, sort of law enforcement, cooperation with the town education. Uh, every time we've raised the question about whether the, either of the colleges would participate in the campus and community coalition because it's really about problem drinking, it's not about the university. Uh, the answer has been, no, Amherst College is not interested. And in in, so your message of wanting to teach responsible drinking, I appreciate. I was just curious if you're aware of why the uh, college has not wanted to participate in the coalition. I, so I'm the longest tenure. I've been at the college for about four years. Um, I cannot speak to that. I'm not aware of um, what parties of the college were having, were engaged in such conversations. Um, Did you want to invite them to join? <laughs> I, was gonna, I think that that would be the next thing is that... Um, When's the next meeting? Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> not till September, but okay. they are monthly and um, uh, I would suggest uh, contacting a couple, one of couple of people actually. Uh, Eric Beal um, is one and uh, Sally Lenowski at both at the university. Either and, and the two of us, um, Connie and I are also people you contact. Um, but uh, this is, um, you know, it's, it's really been a great effort and we've been working now with bringing Hadley in and you know, I think if we could have the college involved too, it would be very helpful. Great, Ms. Kruger. And I could just um, follow up, yeah, the Campus Community Coalition. I think over the many years, there have at times been representation from Amherst College. There hasn't been of late. Um, when I heard about um, what this concept was, I think maybe it was an agenda setting for this meeting, um, I actually think it's a really great idea, and I, so I hope that it's well executed because I actually believe in um, people having experiences with alcohol on campus in a responsible manner. Um, the idea of dry campuses and everything just happens in town and sort of pushed off into the in-town environment for a whole bunch of reasons doesn't make sense to me. So I really um, commend what you're, you know, at least the concept of what you're trying to do and, and it makes a, it makes a lot of sense so I, I wish you well and I, there may be some bumps in the road and uh, you know sharing in the coalition is is one part of that um, but I, I think the idea is good and maybe can be a model for something that could happen on, on some of our other campuses if it so I mean it'll have its challenges you know sure you'll be challenged um, but um, I think it's a great idea 
comment from other colleagues? Ms. Brewer? A couple of questions. One is an internal for us, so if Mr. Steinberg or someone else wants ends up reading the motion at some point, I'd like us to include, and I'm going to botch your last name, although it's written here for me, Flukiger, thank you, it should be obvious, Flukiger's name I would like to have added to our motion since the retail manager is not present, um, just to show that in our motion because that's where the application also came from. And we could probably drop the word Amherst after Keefe Building. Is Student Campus Center Keefe Building an accurate representation of what we call it? What is it really called? <laughs> it is called the Keefe Campus Center. The Keefe Campus Center. Okay, so we should fix that too. Keefe Campus Center. That can be confusing for us if we haven't walked around on campus lately. So thank you, the Keefe Campus Center. Um, in terms of these nine nights, and I appreciate what you are saying in terms of looking at a, a future permanent license, which we would obviously somewhat different um, training and expectations associated with that just in terms of it being clear that it was a permanent going forward. Um, if these nine nights work out, are you planning to come back to us for October and November, or is this just a September thing, or what? what's the theory here? Because if it becomes three nights a week for the foreseeable future, I, I'm not sure I'm willing to go that far on a temporary license. So I just like a sense of scale. Um, so my understanding is that we can do, on one license, we could do 30 events on for one purpose. Um, that's what, as it was, as I understood it in the rules. Um, so our- Bill is shaking her head. It, yes. It's <laughs> to apply. That doesn't mean we have to give it sure. to them. <laughs> no, Possible. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, our intention is to work through the permanent process and hopefully be able to continue until we're able to secure that. Now, if, if it does take an extended period of time, then you know, we would certainly understand um, that there might be some challenges <coughs> with approval of said license on a temporary basis. But you also indicated you're looking to get a, a more permanent we, we are license. working on it. We are actively working on it, yes. Which, of course, would change the circumstance because that license, that location could be licensed. So just to follow up for my colleagues, so obviously you heard my concern, and I, we know that sometimes those take a long time to put together, and then they take a long time to come back from ABCC. So we could, even if we, we did things fairly quickly at our end with the help of our wonderful executive assistant to the town manager, even if we did all the things as pos fast as possible and they do all the things as fast as possible, doesn't mean ABCC is going to do all the things, especially as we're coming up on license renewal time. So. I, I will just express some hesitancy to continue a three time a week temporary for the foreseeable future versus starting off the fall as a, a as a good way of doing it. So if it comes back, I suppose for October, I might not be look too askance, but if it comes back again for November, I'm gonna be I'm starting to be a little edgy because at that point, that's not what temporary licenses are designed for. They are not designed as bridges to permanent licenses. They are for events and this this pretty interesting event. So um, I'm assuming that Chief Livingstone, we, sometimes we have his signature ahead of time and sometimes we don't. I know we never issue until he's actually um, dealt with it. So I guess my other question would be that how many of your people have had conversations with Chief Livingstone? Who's he, has, has he met with several of you or had that chance yet? No. I know vacation schedules and such. No, I, I'm not aware that we've had a conversation with Chief Livingstone. Just a, a comment on the sort of temporary versus in the process of getting, which none of us have control over that timeline really. Um, it's not really part of the motion, but maybe the message is um, this is really only good possibly through first semester by we get to the next semester. It, it's, it's no longer sort of temporary. I mean, we might whether you call that a bridge or not a bridge, but I would I could see this kind of maybe being going you know going on until the end of the first semester, but I think coming back after that puts it in a different category. So that's that's sort of my message about this. It might be a little bit different than how you feel about it. So um, just to address this question, um, if we were in a situation where we were getting close, but we did have to apply again, say in November, would you 
want us to appear again before the select board in order to make this appeal? So my personal feeling is yes, because I'd want to hear a lot about what had happened. And it's one thing to say this is a pretty cool idea, and we, I'm disappointed that we don't already know that the chief is okay with it, but um, obviously it won't get issued if he's not, but I just would rather have heard from him first. And if you need to come back, I would want you to have had another conversation with him for him to have said, yeah, it worked out so well, and yes, you should definitely proceed with this because while we work in independent spheres, we also are giving the chief some direction of saying, we think it's a pretty good idea. Um, even if he might not or vice versa and so I just want to make sure we end up on the same page and so if it does come back to us for additional ones after this I would not expect to be sitting here saying that the chief hadn't been talked to before that set of com before that particular appearance but that's months from now well, yeah, just to address that issue with the chief my understanding is chief Livingstone has reviewed this application and is fine with it but I think certainly if there was uh, a future application, then we would need to go back to him for his review again. So I think he's comfortable with this and wanted me to bring that recommendation to you. Um, but I think it's, it would be prudent if there was another one, you know, in the fall that he would be consulted again. Is there further question or comment for the petitioners? Yes. I guess just to beat that into the ground, assuming that, again, we don't have any initials here that say that the chief has seen it, and so I appreciate that information, but I would want more information than that for a second round of these. I would want to know not only did he say it was a good idea, but I would also want some reporting as to how it worked out, anything that went wrong, anything they end up having to address. I mean, nothing's going to be perfect the first time out with a, a new situation like this, but it doesn't mean that all the things can't be dealt with very effectively, right. but I'd like to hear about that in the future. And just you know, along those lines, what I would suggest is I know that Amherst College has its own police force, and so if there's anything that you're dealing with on campus um, relative to this and your own police force, it'd be great to report back to us as well, even if it doesn't involve or engage our police department, um, just getting an understanding of how your department's handling it or what issues they might have had come up, you know, it would be great for us to understand as well. Yeah, we, we do actually have a plan. We've met with, the, with Chief Carter and uh, spoken about our progressive process about how we're going to manage specific situations. So you know, I feel comfortable that we'll be able to manage uh, the individual uh, situations as they arise. Ms. Wall? Since the horse is still here to be beaten for a while. Um, <laughs> I guess it, this raises a question for me. It sounds like a very good plan, a good idea and a good plan, but do you have a plan to monitor or to report on what you find? I mean, because you could just come back and say it was great, or you could say we had so many people and so many incidents. I mean, and yeah. if the police are not involved, that's, you know, obviously the police are involved, that's one kind of reporting, but what about just sort of day by day mood of the place and behavior and student satisfaction and so forth? Uh, so currently our plan is to implement an incident log um, so any issues that come come up whether it's rude behavior or inappropriate uh, you know somebody who's drinking that's not of age then we would uh, report that in the log and uh, we would certainly report that to um, anybody that would be appropriate on campus as well as back to you as you know and, and Honestly, I mean, I honestly expect to have some issues. I think that there will be issues, and students are going to check the boundaries and uh, try to push them. But uh, you know, to the best of our ability, we'll try to remind them about the benefits of this situation and, and the space, and hopefully people appreciate it and um, we'll be able to come to you know, a, a better culture on campus around this. Just, what, just to be clear, I also meant positive things, you know, maybe there's, it would be interesting to sample student opinion, you know, if they give you some kind of feedback sure. as to whether it's working, whether it's filling a need, whether it, you know, whatever you can find, not just yeah. the instance that are. Any question or comment? Are we ready for a motion? I can make it. Okay. So, I move to approve the application for a special wine and malt license for Amherst College, 95 College Street, recurring pub nights in the Keefe Campus Center, no word, Amherst, on September 13th, 14th, 15th, 20th, 21st, 22nd, 27th, 28th, and 29th, 2018, from 7 p.m. to 1 a.m., 
Rosa Gomez, retail manager, and Joseph, you just told me, um, manager. We have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Mm -hmm. And that's unanimous. Thank you both very much. Appreciate the and, time. Um, if you don't have a card and an email address um, about the second so follow up on the CCC, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So we'll next we'll take up um, while well, we're in the licenses public way section of our. Uh, of our agenda. The next we'll take up is the public way, a permission to close North Pleasant Street from Triangle Street to, in, to Massachusetts Avenue for a parade hosted by the University Museum of Contemporary Art on September 22nd. So if you'd come forward and tell us a little bit about your event, what kinds of things are happening. First, introduce yourselves to the microphone so we and the viewing audience know who is here. I'm Sandy Litchfield, and um, I work at UMass. I'm Elizabeth Pangburn, I'm a local theater artist. So I don't know if any of you are familiar, we already, uh, res I don't think, we didn't go through the select board, but we went through Paul Bockelman and some other Amherst committees uh, to do the Crosstown Contemporary Art Exhibition um, that I curated with Loretta Yarlow with the museum. And we are planning to have a symposium on September 22nd. Um, the opening or the reception will be on the 21st. The, the symposium is an all day event at the design building and campus at UMass. And originally the idea was that we were gonna have a walking tour of all of the sculptures from the symposium into the town of Amherst. And that grew into uh, an art parade. <laughs> Um, and then we recruited Elizabeth Pangburn with Theater Truck to help us organize that. She's been a really great organizer of that event and help, helped us kind of expand to a lot of performers around, around the um, Pioneer Valley. Um, so, after, so our idea is that after the symposium, we would have a one hour uh, kind of performance parade that would take, um, uh, the audience through the 12 sculptures. So we would start at the Fine Arts Center and it would go through um, North Pleasant, is that what it is? I always get East Pleasant and North Pleasant mixed up, into Kendrick Park and it would, it would be about an hour. Um, and yeah, so Elizabeth has done all the kind of footwork with the permit to get this going. Um, and uh, the idea was to close the the road down for that hour. Um, anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I think the road closure is important for a few reasons. First, it um, uh, creates a more inclusive space, so more members of the community will have their voices heard, their faces seen, and will be able to participate in the event. We're anticipating um, up to 150 people. We're not um, going to assume to know how many of them are of what ability. And thinking about where the sculptures are positioned, there's a lot of uneven terrain. And I think that it is important to allow um, our audience members to experience the art from where they are comfortable and to provide uh, the option to have the flat surface for whomever um, prefers it or needs it. And I just want to add, so this is kind of, <clears throat> the, the symposium is more of sort of a community academic experience. The parade is really for all ages, all people. We want it to be inclusive. We want, we want to see kids on bikes, people on roller skates maybe, some, you know, it's, it's open to everybody. Um, so having it on the street kind of um, makes it just more accessible in general. Yeah, and it redefines that corridor in a visceral communal way, which creates new memories. And in that way, um, the space is activated in, a, in another way, right? We can talk about it, we can think about it, we can look, but once we physically experience that space, um, it, it becomes something new. And that's the, um, the way in which we can reimagine and then, and then live that experience in that space. Um, 
The final thing I just want to say for, for those of you who aren't familiar with the XTCA kind of project goals, one of our main goals was um, to build a kind of a bridge, an arts and culture bridge between the town of Amherst and the university and particularly focused around this gateway district, um, sort of imagining that as planners are, are thinking about how to develop frat, frat Green, how to develop Kendrick Park, that arts and culture are kind of part of that conversation. So. Thank you. So do we have questions or comments? Mr. Steinberg? Yeah, um, first of all, it sounds very exciting. So, you know, hope this can work out, but I have to, have to ask Mr. Zomak, has um, there have been discussions that you're aware of with the police department and the public works department about the challenges that would be involved in this closure? Uh, coming into this meeting a little bit late, not fully briefed on everything, I understand that Chief Livingstone has reviewed the plan and uh, has no issues. I think there would need to be discussion about uh, detailed officers. I know Mr. Mooring is here sitting in the back. I'm not sure if he's been consulted yet about um, the closure, um, but I know Chief Livingstone would need to you know, consult with you further about what it would mean in terms of police, policing both ends and making sure that, you know, traffic is stopped at the appropriate time. And, and there would be, and Mr. Mooring is giving the thumbs up, which. Um, I have been playing phone tag with Captain Gunderson. Mm -hmm. So I, she had a few questions and we'll certainly answer those the best we can. Mm -hmm. and, and there may need to be more information provided to Mr. Mooring, the superintendent of public works, in terms of what assistance he might need to provide. Other questions? Comments, Ms. Brewer. So having nothing to do with the people in front of us, we have a, a packet that has pages one, three, and five in it, not pages two and four. So <laughs> made a little trouble to follow all the really interesting stuff you gave us, but um, we're working on it, and copy machines don't always do what you want. I, that's, if you wanted to email it to us, that'd be great. If you wanted to re-email it, that'd be great. Um, I think that I'm a little frustrated that we are seeing again that we don't have any approvals listed on material that's in our packet when they could have been approved and that could have been initialed before we got it but that's okay and we have a limited schedule coming up so um, obviously we're in support of this project we had heard about it from Mr. Bachman associate the parks the reason you didn't have to come to the select board before was because it was on parks and parks aren't up to us in terms of what gets put on them and so um, but once you wrote close a road or want some parking spaces then we're the folks you get to see okay. um, so that that was the difference there um, the parade is very exciting. It's obviously a couple of days after the block party, and so people will already be used to the road being <laughs> closed in a different direction, right? So it'll be fine. It's just September. We do fun stuff in we September. Just keep it closed it'll, it'll be it'll be fine. Other questions or comments? So again, just to be clear, it's on the 22nd of September, correct? Which is and, a Saturday. Which is a Saturday, and the parade will start at what time? Four o'clock. Four o'clock. All right. Um, it's the only question that I have is, has anybody checked to make sure there's no home game from the football team that day? It's ironic you sure say that because I was just thinking the same thing, whether or not oh, the, yeah, no, uh, in I'm town or not in town. Do we know? So that should probably look that up really quickly on our various devices. We just look for UMass. <laughs> UMass football schedule will probably. Are you looking at us now? Yeah. I'm, oh, I'm not a football. I'm just going to calendar. I've actually looked at that schedule and not closely. Um, uh, lots of things in practice. Schedule. September 22nd is the, uh, let's see, versus Charlotte in Amherst. Aww. The class of 2022 game faculty and staff appreciation day while well, they're at it. Um, <clears throat> so that may be something that, that from the standpoint of uh, public works and, and the police that they may want to think about and you may want to interact with your campus police as well relative to that. It, it may be that it makes your event even bigger and better. Um, 
So it's, that's enough. not a game changer. That's just a communication. Yes. Say what time? Okay. It's at 3.30. Yeah, the, the football game is at 3.30 p.m. It starts at 3.30. Okay, so yeah. it'll be while the game is happening. Right, yeah. that is correct. So that cuts, oh, in some ways, that too. cuts down on any conflict of right. transportation sort of thing because folks going to the game will be going before that. The parade mm -hmm. will happen, and then the game will finish. So that may or may not be a good thing, but yes. Yeah, I, if somehow the minutes could reflect that we, we asked that the different police departments work with each other on this so that we don't have people, I mean, we'll always have complaints, but at least the people <laughs> who are in charge of receiving those complaints will at least be apprised of what's going on ahead of time so they can think right. it through, as yeah. was mentioned earlier, and then uh, that we're, we're counting on that level of cooperation to make <clears throat> it work smoothly. Other questions or comments for the for the folks that are here. If not, I would entertain a motion on this. It's right there. Yes, Ms. Kruger. Um, I move to approve the application for closure of North Pleasant Street from Triangle Street to Massachusetts Avenue for a parade hosted by the UMass Contemporary Art Perens UMass XTCA friends on Saturday, September 22nd, 2018, from 3 to 6 p.m. Elizabeth Pangburn, organizer. Thank you. A motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, you'll have an excellent event. Perhaps some folks will come visit that in lieu of going to the football game. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Thank you. So next item, we'll go up to <clears throat> 7B, which is Change of Manager Mission Cantina, because I believe those folks are here. So if they would like to come forward and I'm not seeing anybody here for the public hearing, so I'm not as panicked about starting in right. on time. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi there. If you would, please just introduce yourself and take us through this. Uh, Christy Bodine, Legal Solutions in Plain English PC, uh, representing Mission Cantina. This is a change of manager. It's uh, actually technically not a public hearing. It's just a select board review. Right. This is Kristen Milkovich. She's McClinovich. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> terrible with her name. And I have a replacement for the certificate of LLC vote for the packet. There were a couple of typos in it. So I created another original that should be added into the packet that goes to the ABCC. Sure that yeah, we'll yeah. make sure that he's yeah. two, two fingers. Right. Um, I, I keep spelling her name wrong, and I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> and it's so close Everybody to mine does. that I really shouldn't do that. <laughs> so Kristen, as you can see from the packet, has a lot of, of management experience with, and a lot of experience with alcohol. And Sam's um, getting involved in a couple of other projects. So the ABCC was concerned that he ought not to be the full-time manager of several businesses, so we're bringing, Kristen's actually been working there for quite a while, so she's going to be the manager for liquor license purposes so that Sam can focus on a couple of other businesses. Um, okay, so if you have any questions, fire away. Does the board have questions for, for the folks that are here? Steinberg, would you like yeah. to? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to be really brief on this one. Um, I say every time we have somebody come in for a change of manager, something that you're probably well aware of, that um, we do look at, as you heard earlier, and the question of underage drinking and problem drinking is, is, is something that we have to be attentive to as a university and college community. Um, I have not been aware of any problems with the restaurant that you've been involved with, and I know, that, and I did read with appreciation your extensive experience. Um, so, um, just to make you aware that we're very conscious of this, and we count on a cooperative relationship between our licensees and um, our police department to um, make sure that all state laws are adhered to fully and. Um, um, I don't really have any questions. Be happy to make a motion. Anyone else have any questions? Feel free. Um, I move to approve the application for change of manager of an annual all alcoholic on premises liquor license number 0011RS0024 
for MGB1 LLC doing business as Mission Cantina 485 West Street, Amherst, to Ms. Kristen Nicole Leklanovich. Second. And there's a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that, any opposed? I didn't think so. That's unanimous. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. So now in our agenda, we'll, we'll shift to, uh, we have two public hearings, uh, or two parking changes that call for a public hearing. And so I think that Prior. we will, yes? Prior to opening the public hearing, which we don't actually have a motion for, but I presume we need one since this one actually is a public hearing, or right. these two are actually public hearings. I would just like some indication of if I somehow fell asleep during our previous discussion of these coming forward to us because I'm feeling frustrated that the first time I'm finding out that we're having a hearing on Monday is on Friday. So um, when we get, I thought that we talked about this and I know we've been through some transitions, but I thought we talked about the fact that when we had to put legal notices out, which we did in this case, unlike the Mission Cantina, change of license, that the select board would get copied on those hearing notices when they happened, not because if I hadn't looked at my packet and Saturday morning gone off to the grocery store, I don't feel any obligation that I should be looking for public hearing notices in the Gazette to see if we're doing something in the future. So I'm, I'm feeling frustrated that I had no idea these hearings were coming until I saw the Friday packet, even though the public's been noticed about them. And if these had been more controversial, which hopefully they aren't since no one else is here to talk about them other than Mr. Mooring and Mr. Zomek, um, I'm sure the public would like more notice than I understand. I'm perfectly aware that legal notices are all that's required and 48 hours notice is all that's required of them. I just don't feel like it's in the spirit of public input to because the newspaper publishers organization in Massachusetts has forced us to put in public hearing notices that no one reads, um, that that somehow covers the spirit of Amherst making changes in our parking system. Right. So it's the public and it's as a board member. I don't appreciate only finding out on Friday that we're having an actual public hearing on a Monday. So I would like us to somehow, I don't know if we need to make a checklist no one's ever wanted to have a checklist for anything ever in this community, but something like a checklist associated with when we have to do the hearing. Oh, I've just, you know, I know that staff does all this work. You know, they have to write it up. They have to get to the Gazette by a certain time, and when that happens, check it gets sent to the select board. Something along those lines. Um, I did make a notice of, a note of that. I was thinking we discussed this ever so briefly at our last meeting, which of course was three weeks ago. That. There might be parking changes coming, but we may have been very vague and not specific. Or was so, it agenda? Well, that's what I'm not recalling perfectly as well. But right. yes. If I could, uh, I'd be happy to bring those comments from Ms. Brewer to Mr. Bockelman. Uh, I too sit in on the agenda setting, and I'm I'm a little. Uh, uh, fuzzy on whether we talked about it at agenda setting or whether you talked about it or Mr. Bockelman mentioned it to you at a, at a previous meeting. Um, I think the spirit of this was that it's a, um, I realize it is still a public hearing, but that it is a positive change adding parking spaces that aren't there. But again, it might have been an agenda setting and we, um, we will make a note of that so, for future hearings. Uh, I would suggest we open the hearing because I have some other comments around process related, but I'd like them to be in the context of the hearing. Okay. So if someone might offer <laughs> in their best guess of how to, to get our public hearing opened, we'll also have to close it before we actually take action. I so think we'll if you read the legal notice. I think that was the idea, was that we the might. The two legal use, notices and then that's what we will say do. that you're opening the hearing. Now I, I just think have that to would be sufficient. It, which I think is in this section. So I will do that. And you have glasses on, so you'll Maybe be able to do that. The end, I think. Mm -hmm. Come on, I saw them earlier. They're in here. This 
Mr. Semek has one of them right in front of him. I know. I may just start reading the one you've got in front of you. <laughs> All right. So here's the first. Uh, the Amherst Select Board will hold a public hearing on Monday, August 13, 2018, beginning at 7 p.m. Town Room, Amherst Town Hall, to solicit public comment on proposed new and or review of existing parking regulations for Dickinson Street. The Select Board will be considering changes to parking regulations, including but not limited to parking restrictions. Uh, I don't think we need to go into the changes to be voted, although they're listed there. That was published on the 26th of July, I believe. Is that what that's I think you're indicated? supposed to read the whole notice, Mr. Slaughter. I'm, I'm really not trying to be difficult. No, no, I just I think just, you're supposed to. I'm happy to. Changes to be voted. DPW is proposing the following parking regulation for Dickinson Street. All distances are measured from the intersection of Main and Dickinson. West side of Dickinson, no parking slash tow zone for the entire length. East side of Dickinson, no parking slash tow zone from Main Street for a distance of, distance of 50 feet. Parking from 50 feet to 390 feet. No parking tow zone from 390 feet to 500 feet. Parking from 500 feet to 690 feet. No parking slash tow zone from 690 feet to College Street. So that is the entirety of that. And so with that, we'll open. Do you want to go ahead and read the second one? And we'll, we'll just I'll open them the at the same well time. Well, while we're at it, and then we can open them both at the same time. So the public hearing notice, the Amherst Select Board will hold a public hearing on Monday, August 13, 2018 at 7 p.m. in the town room of Amherst Town Hall to solicit public comment on proposed changes to the parking regulations for Spring Street. These changes will occur on the north side of Spring Street, specifically between Seely Street and Webster Street. The select board will be considering changes to parking regulations, including but not limited to parking restrictions, tow zones, and or addition of free or metered parallel parking spaces. That was dated August 1st. Thank you, Mr. Steinberg. And so we'll, relative to those, we'll open the meeting at, at the official time here, 735. I write down the right time. <laughs> okay. So, Mr. Mooring, if you'd like to introduce these two to us, and then we'll and we'll see if anyone else has a comment relative to that, and then we'll we'll go from there. So go right ahead, please. Right. Good evening. Uh, so the Dickinson Street parking re uh, regulations are basically what has always been there, but we were going through the ordinances and we were putting the signs back up after the reconstruction, and we didn't find all the parking regulations present. So instead of just trying to put together what we thought was missing, uh, what you have here is a new regulation which covers the entire street and basically puts the parking where it was originally, minus where we put the bump outs at the intersection of um, Spring Street and Dickinson, and it um, formalizes where the no parking was originally as well. So it's really no change to what was there before, it just kind of formalizes everything. Um, and there was no timed or permitted parking here. This was just one of those great American free things, free parking. Yes, Ms. Kerr. So I'm curious, um, does the Downtown Parking Working Group have any information about these proposed changes? Uh, no, they do not. Because? I was not told to send it to them. So if I may continue, mm -hmm. so after spending two somewhat torturous years, more or less, on that committee, um, I, these probably are all reasonable, minor, and positive, but um, I'm having a problem uh, that they were not consulted or included since they've been working on this and taking a look at whether it should be metered or we have some hybrids where we have permit parking and meters in that part of town and any number of things. So it just sort of went by them. Um, I had mentioned uh, in a different meeting with Mr. Balcom and then you might want to inform the chair, that's why I think it might have been an agenda setting, um, that um, I informed the chair um, when I read my packet. Um, but I am uncomfortable acting on this. Um, because of that lack of process. So um, I plan to abstain if we take up these motions tonight. Other questions or comments relative to this? So I do have one <clears throat> question. As I was driving down that street this evening uh, on my way here, uh, there are a number of, in some of those areas where there is parking allowed or is suggested that parking is allowed, 
and I was, you know, I was, I didn't have a tape measure out. Uh, there are driveways that cut through those spaces, and so they're not expressly prohibited. Is there existing regulation or law that prevents parking in front of a driveway, even though parking is in the, in the way the motion, you know, the, the the description is allowed? It would some of the parking space crosses a driveway, so there is a there conflict. is a separate regulation saying you can't block a driveway. Okay. So most of the so places where you see see parking allowed, there is no call out for each individual driveway. It's right. for a length of time. Okay. Just, I figured that was probably the case, but I just want to confirm that that was the case. All right. Are there other questions on this particular one? Yes. Yes. So, um, so the the punishment for not having regulations written down before is that then you realized you needed to bring it to us, and so then now you're getting questioned about it. So yeah, it's not a very affirming sort of experience. Um, nonetheless, if we were to approve this, which you're saying basically puts it back to how it was before um, the work was done, then if the downtown parking working group comes up with a new plan, is there going to be any difficulty um, or substantial expense associated with redoing this? No, not at all. And then if the downtown working group were to decide to do something differently, it would only be recommended in the areas where you're allowing parking. So in those areas, that could be the place where you either have um, the hybrid meter town center parking or you could have town center parking. But you, we would not recommend the have parking in the no parking areas. Ms. Kruger. Um, following up that line of thought, um, would it what would be the detrimental effect of keeping the hearing open until um, they were to weigh in at their September meeting and then taking this up again? So certainly the cost of re-advertising a public hearing for parking changes. The only issue we're going to have is down at the s southern end of Dickinson on the east side has been kind of taken over by the Amherst College contractors and we've all been hoping to get them moved out and so before school started, that's the only issue that would be a, would come Start up. ticketing them. Now you can't ticket them because <laughs> there's no parkings. Right. All right. Ms. Brewer. I actually did want to ask about that particular issue, which is that, and I, I appreciate, hey, look, free parking. But um, obviously that was never our intention, and it's too bad we didn't figure out a way to deal with it sooner. I think it was so our intention, actually. It was never my intention to allow contractors to park free anywhere, ever. Um, I think we can, <laughs> so um, along those lines, and it's not a particularly wide street, and those are particularly large vehicles frequently parked there. Um, so getting it done before school starts, I can appreciate because it's setting not only the tone for Amherst College, but also for the people who live there with children on Dickinson Street, of which there are still one or two, I believe. And so um, I appreciate the timeliness issue of it from that standpoint, although I certainly can also appreciate the downtown parking working group's frustration. I don't see that the downtown parking working group is going to get much more information about this in a quick period of time and with this hearing that it's not like we're putting in a bunch of machines that we'd have to rip back out or something i guess my inclination would be to go forward with this with the understanding that it would also go on the downtown parking working group's agenda for them to be able to report back that they're you know that this is one of the many things that they wish to consider as they consider all the other things they're talking about and as you all know, I wanted downtown parking working group to be finished, and it's not finished. But um, uh, I can, <laughs> if they're going to continue, then I can understand why they may wish to review this as as part of their as part of their um, charge associated with that. So from that standpoint, the other thing I do just want to mention, I know I mentioned checklists earlier. I have all these crazy process ideas. I know, but um, we don't have a book that's called parking regulations. We have a cut and paste Word document that we've seen that has had dates at the beginning, dates at the end. It's random. So I'm really looking forward to the assistant town manager talking to the town manager, talking to the executive assistant to the town manager about how we're going to bring that into, I don't know, the 19th century at least, associated with being able to keep track of our regulations because obviously these will be things that future town council will want to be able to look at and it's kind of embarrassing at this point in terms of 
how it's put together. And this is nice, but this is going to be tacked on to a Word document at this point, um, rather than it's not like there's any template here or anything to work with. So I appreciate that you're doing it. I do. <laughs> so um, having it written down is excellent, but I hope that in, as part of the transition, there will be discussion around what would be a good way? You know, like what, what's a good standard practice of keeping track of these things? I'm not trying to make it into an 80 page ordinance, you know, that, that has all these template things all over it and this much print on the page. I've seen those, they're not pleasant. But we need to do something different because Mr. Mooring's willingness to dig through and find those things um, and Ms. Pupples prior to that and Ms. Mills now, it just doesn't seem like a particularly effective way of hoping that everyone's brain thinks to go dig for that there. Last comment. I mean, even though I was um, grouching about um, the parking committee missing out on this, I would say I'll, I'll sort of channel from any opportunity to add more spaces is welcome in this part of town or in the downtown. So I think that from that respect, that's a good thing, even though I guess we are taking some away on Dickinson, but um, they're not really available right now anyway. They're, so. Mr. Steinberg? Yeah, actually, just in response to that last comment, I, I don't think we're taking them away because what we were, what we're doing is, tr is I understand it, and this is where there is a question, is we're getting back to where we to were before the construction, mm -hmm. but finding that we actually needed the change in the um, regulations to be formalized here to coincide with what was originally posted mm -hmm. and what we really want to repost. We're therefore not right. changing anything for the downtown parking working group. They're in no worse position than they would have been as far as if this was a street they wanted to pay attention to where they would have been to begin with? Uh, not really. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's why I was... Uh, because we put the bump out at the end of Spring Street on Dickinson, you actually did lose two, two parking spaces. There were two parking... If you, got, if you go down directly towards Spring Street, there used to be two spaces on Dickinson that you could drive right into if you didn't stop at the stop sign. So there are two spaces that went away because we put in the bump out to accommodate for the handicap ramps and the crosswalk there to go from Dickinson to Spring Street. Because there wasn't a crosswalk originally between Dickinson Spring uh, Sidewalk and the Spring Street Sidewalk. So yes, technically on Dickinson you're down to, and, but if you take care of the ones on Spring Street that we're talking about next, you gain f five for a net gain of three. It's more in Springs that you more change. Um, right. <clears throat> so we did lose two. I don't. Right. Right. So the other piece. Um, so is there any more questions or comments well, just, on Dickinson Street? Cause well, just um, kind of in that line. So what we're looking at are really some things that have happened on the ground and changes that sort of go back about a year ago. And um, I guess sort of clean up. We're, we're just seeing this now from a parking point of view, but this is. This is done. This is on, on, on the ground changes that were known a long time ago. So if you'd like to walk us through the, the other set of changes on, on um, where is it, Webster Street? So on, uh, on Spring Street, we were actually working on a sewer issue we have on Webster Street. And as we were laying out the sewer changes, we started realizing, hey, there's a lot of open space here on the sort of the north side of Spring Street between Seeley and Webster. And as we started researching it, we realized that we had enough space to put in a sidewalk and parking. So what we did is we've laid it out. Um, we've already dug it out. It's ready to be built. We're going to redo Webster Street this year, repave Webster Street. And when we repave Webster Street, we're going to install the sidewalk and the parking. So actually, this one's ahead of the ball. We're asking for you to go ahead and make this town center parking the way the rest of the parking is in this area town center parking and uh, then we'll there will be the same okay when you say town center parking what do you mean um it's open for town center town center permits that's so permits okay because this is a street i've looked at a couple times and has been in play for discussion about whether um it would be metered or permit or whatever so um it it, it Things are kind of 
on hold with the parking committee waiting for a consultant. So this, I would just reserve off the, the idea that we've disposed of this in some final way because it's pretty close to the area of, of concern. And with the um, knowledge of the new construction on Spring Street, we know the parking pressure will increase in this area. So this, just a, you know, this is a project known for a while, but it's an area of interest, that's all. Well, and also we, we put it to what's there with the other one. So when, if anybody wants to change the whole area, you'd be changing similar parking. There wouldn't be one section that was some type of metered hybrid and then one section that wasn't side by side. It'll be the same as kind of how we did this one. <coughs> the south side will be town center permit and the north side's town center did permit. It, not yet in consultation with the parking committee? No, because we're building now and then they won't get to it. Well. <laughs> Bert, did you have a question I, or comment? I'm just hoping that when the time comes to make the memo, I can take the first crack at it. It's all memo. I'm asking. But we probably are still checking to see if we're ready to close the hearing. So. Which memo? What memo? So the, just to be clear as far as the, the additional spots that you're talking about in this particular case are between Sealy and Webster on the north side. That's the additional spots which are currently not parking at all? There are no parking. It's grass. And there is a sidewalk going in as well. Are there further questions? Yes, Ms. Brewer. So you said that's five spaces, which is giving us a net gain then? Yes. Over there. And then three. the way town center parking usually goes is there's no markings for spaces. So technically there'll be more spaces because everybody, if there's no marking, people just fill it in. But there's five technical spaces. Further comments, questions? I guess at this point we have two, technically I think we have two mm -hmm. separate public hearings simultaneously open. Mm -hmm. And so we would have potentially two hearings to close and potentially two motions to take up if we chose to. Um, so is anyone wanting to close the um, wants you to know there's hearing, two, two which would be necessary to take action on the motion? Uh, we could leave the hearing open if we feel like we need to wait until sometime later, but I am, yes. I move to close both public hearings. Second. <clears throat> Motion and second to close the hearings. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay, so the hearing will be closed at 7.50. And so now we can potentially take up motions, which I think are our most recent version of our motion sheets on the very back page. Didn't know if anyone wanted to make those motions or not. Uh, so I like, would like to make those motions yeah. if I could. I'm gonna try and then other people can fix them. Okay, so I move to approve the parking regulations on Dickinson Street, entire length, as presented, cross out the words in detail, I will never ever make a motion that says that in it, in the Mooring Memo of July 18th, 2018. Uh, Superintendent of Public Works, you can reorder that however you want. And it doesn't need to say at the August 13th select board meeting. So this is kind of a backwards motion. It's talking about what we're doing tonight, which none of our mo other motions say. We approved it tonight. Um, and it's saying in detail by Mr. Mooring, and that's not gonna fly. So we need to show that it's based on the memo that he wrote to us. So something along those lines, but you can cross out everything after Mooring because it's tonight. Ms. Brewer, when you say, when you added the, the Mooring memo, when you wanna put a date with that? Yes, July 18th, 2018. Memo by Superintendent of Public Works, Guilford Mooring. Yeah, sorry. Is there a second? second? Okay, so we have a motion and a second. We'll uh, formalize what was the on the ground circumstance previous to the uh, repaving of that street. That's why I preferred to say regulations rather than <laughs> right. changes. So, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Abstain. We have one abstention. That's four to zero with one abstention. 
See if I can botch the next one. Right ahead. All right. <laughs> oh, okay. I move to approve the parking regulations on the north side of Spring Street between, okay, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna try again. I move to approve the parking regulations for approximately five spaces on the north side of Spring Street between Sealy and Webster Streets as described in the 72718 memo by Superintendent of Public Works Guilford Mooring, parking spaces subject to the town center parking permit system. Since all of these, and you can put that in earlier in the motion if you prefer, but I'm trying to make it clear that these are different. These aren't just signs that say parking or no parking. They're they're to the town center parking, and town center parking doesn't mean enough to most of us. It's town center parking permit system. Is there a second? All right, so we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? We have another abstention. So we have four to zero with one abstention. So thank you for that, Mr. Mooring. Welcome. Good night. Can we take a brief recess? Yes, we can. Why don't we take a short recess and we'll come back to our agenda in about five minutes or so. We're, we're back. Uh, oh, no, this, <laughs> good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Do actually. some deep breathing. <laughs> That's right. It's all good. Mini yoga session in the in the hallway. Um, <laughs> I didn't know, uh, so a suggestion was made that we take up the consent calendar just to sort of finish that section of our agenda, so I'm happy to entertain a motion on, in that regard if we'd like to, um, which is on the front page of our motion sheet if someone wanted to make that motion or had any. I, I move to approve the remaining items listed on the consent calendar on the August 13th, 2018 agenda as presented. Second. <clears throat> Second. Say number seven and blah, blah, blah. So B, C, and D weren't part of the consent calendar. Yeah, I was going to so say they they actually the, the motion well, the, the motion calendar. can be just the consent calendar okay. because those items be. were not in the consent calendar. Right, right. That's we you'd already pulled them out. We had already yes. pulled them out. Yes. So, so, so the, I just moved to approve the items. All right, and there's a no, second. Sorry. Is there further discussion? Mm -hmm. Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so that passes unanimously. I will make a quick note. I looked at. Uh, in looking at some of those, some of those that are in unusual places, had some additional notes about yes. how they choose to, uh, how they'll try to secure the area, and so that's greatly appreciated by those folks. Thank you for mentioning that because we do appreciate that. All right, so moving back to uh, section four of our agenda action and discussion items, uh, at the request of Mr. Zomek, we'll take up four A I I I <laughs> first. Because we have, we have a couple of items, uh, we have three items relative to Chapter 61 land, and two of them are related, and one of them is is not as tied to the first two, and so you'd like to talk about that one first. So that's 4A III, or three. So if you'd like to. Sure. Um, so I'll be very brief on this one. This is a very traditional um, um, Chapter 61 request that I think the, the board is quite used to. Um, uh, this is a very small uh, parcel of land that is being offered um, from Coles to a buyer. Uh, our standard practice is to receive a purchase and sale agreement to then um, get input from town council and then also get input from the planning board and the conservation commission relative to whether uh, the parcel of land in, in question um, is something that we'd be interested in buying or stepping into essentially the right of first refusal. In this case, both the Planning Board and the Conservation Commission recommended that we not um, exercise our right of first refusal. Um, so this is uh, rather in, in the traditional vein of these coming to us. The other two are, are quite different, so I wanna take those together in a, in a separate discussion. Yes. 
Mr. Zlamek, just it, these are typical, you know, somewhat understood by us. We get them a lot. But for people who might be watching um, the, this meeting or after this meeting, could you just briefly say what? we're talking about why what 61A is and why this comes before us, just to give a little background for somebody who might not be as familiar as we are with these types of requests. Sure, landowners in Massachusetts have the opportunity to have their, um, to hold their property in three different categories, chapter 61, 61A, or 61B, uh, and receive a lower tax assessment. Um, uh, in doing that, they um, uh, work with our assessor, uh, sometimes with a forester um, and keeping their land in active forest production or active agricultural land. Um, in exchange for that, when they go to convert their land or sell for another purpose, uh, they need to notice the town, the community in which they're doing this or, or hold land, um, in this case Amherst, and the town has the opportunity um, for two things. One is uh, we uh, um, uh, have a right of first refusal. We can step into their purchase and sale agreement if it is a piece of property that the town is interested in. And we are allowed to assess the property five years of back taxes uh, when the land is converted to another use. Um, so in this case, um, Coles is selling a very small uh, piece of property to an adjacent landowner of point. Uh, 096 plus or minus acres. Um, they included a plan. Uh, this is in um, in North Amherst off of Leverett Road uh, for the sum of $2,000. So this is what I, I meant. Thank you for the, the comment. We deal with these all the time, so it becomes um, a rather routine. Uh, in this case, this is one that fits a very similar pattern to many others. Um, and again, the Conservation Commission took this up in their recent uh, e uh, meeting. You have a memo from me. Uh, the Planning Board uh, likewise did that. Uh, and you have a memo from Christine Brestrup, the Planning Director. And both of those memos indicate uh, a recommendation that we not exercise, recommend to you that the town not exercise our right of first refusal to purchase the land. Mr. Steinberg, do you have a question? Yes. Um, I guess that I still uh, I'll state my concern at first and then come back with a question if appropriate. The original motion sheet, and I appreciate that we've been going through a lot of um, changes and we've a uh, uh, system working in the uh, town manager who's not uh, drafted some of these motions before, but the original motion um, was not in the form that we normally have, which is uh, to use the words um, make move not to exercise or move to exercise the town's right of first refusal. There's another piece that's in prior motions, and what I had done was um, pulled out a motion from previous select board meeting where we had acted on the 61 um, um, a, a waiver and that included, um, and this was my recollection, an approximation of the acreage in addition to the description of the land. And that's not included in the motions, um, the amended motions that are on the motion sheet that we have before us. So I was, um, I guess the questions I have was, since that has been in prior motions, and the one that I cited when I sent um, a note to you earlier today, Mr. Zomak, which was to point out the February 12, 2018 motion sheet um, and it did include the approximate um, acreage. Is that of legal significance? And it, having worked with our town council for many years, I find that there are <clears throat> no set standards. I mean, if you're dealing with different attorneys at Coleman and Page, they often there's there's style issues, et cetera. I see no reason why we wouldn't include the acreage. So uh, I, I, if we've used it in the past 
and um, working with Ms. Mills, um, you know, earlier today to amend the motions that were put together, I believe, on Friday. Uh, I see no reason why in all three of these motions we don't add the approximate acreage. So if Mr. Steinberg would like to add that to the revised motion, which does read move to, to or not exercise the town's right of first refusal. Um, the way the one that had been worded with, read was to per, uh, in accordance with MGL chapter 61A section 14 to purchase approximately, and that one said 0 0.3, uh, so it would be. So you stick it in between. Instead of uh, instead of the word land, that's where it would have, it would have fit in to to uh, purchase approximately zero point nine point zero nine six acres. Having a little trouble oh, keeping yeah. track of these three different proper set yeah. motions, but is is that the right and acreage for that motion? Yeah, it's three. <laughs> it's, three. three. It's, it's three. It's four A I I I. Let's just check. But you got the parcel numbers on the documents here too. Yeah, it's that's right. why. I, uh, it's not in the motion though. No, but it, part the parcel's in the motion. 61A. It's parcel A. It's the very short name. Hold on. Let's take a quick look at Let, that, Let's things. take a moment. Uh, a moment. In so which okay. then gets... It doesn't have a parcel number. It does? No. doesn't? Parcel 61. No, it's MGL 61, parcel A. Oh, parcel A. Okay. I see. That's, the, that's confusing because the MGL is there. Just the, the grammar. Middle. Okay, parcel A. Uh, that's a very MGL. short number. Yeah, MGL. actually... I don't know why MGL is listed twice. That doesn't make any sense. It should just be parcel A. Yeah, it shouldn't be MGL, should not be in there. 0.96 uh, acres of land owned by W.D. Coles, Inc. Which gets me parcel to my A second off. question as we're doing this, which um, on a motion that has apparent legal significance, is it essential that we do this tonight or can this motion be revisited um, and come back to us next Monday. Well, we just, don't want to do this on the 20th. You know? Well, if we can just, if we can just, um, I mean, can we quickly redo the motion here? I mean, I think the concern is if we don't get it right, then we're so <clears throat> more work for ourselves and a lot of troubles. Yes. Ms. Brewer. My suggestion would be that we do go ahead and take a few minutes to try and get it right now, which is going to be difficult because we have to remove the word MGL from the middle of the motion. And hopefully the, the a dash parcel. Yeah. Yeah. Is, and have it just start with parcel. We, we had some cut and paste issues here. Um, but to then say that get, if we can count on the assistant town manager to get this to KP law, and get it checked before, as soon as possible, so that Monday we could do a quick, and they yeah, said, oh, action. just add this one thing to it. Because frequently in the past, reflecting back to what Mr. Zemeck already said, frequently in the past, we've had an exact motion written out by Ms. Everett of KP Law, and that obviously hasn't happened here. And so, um, like you say, you deal with different attorneys and they do things different ways. But it looks like we had to cobble this together on our own, which is not our strong suit. So in that case, if I'm hearing the board correctly, um, I guess I'd prefer not to take the time to rework the motions. I, I don't see unless... We were really trying to keep things business off of the agenda for the 20th yeah and that's why i feel a little protective of that agenda and i think we did come up with wording and we can insert the acreage and if needed we can take a corrective action on the 20th but we'll have acted tonight and then we have the opportunity to correct i mean i was going to suggest as a compromise that i mean i don't really when the wording is right we'll vote for it it's not taking time out of our agenda on the 20th to take three seconds to vote for three motions and say yes or no. So I guess if we're 
convinced that the substance of these things is acceptable in the form of, you know, maybe we could, we could achieve consensus on our satisfaction comfort level with the action being proposed, and then the formal vote can take literally five seconds next time. I don't know. Because otherwise, if you're going to do it tonight and have to fix it, you're doing it twice. If and we have to more fix time. it Monday, though, it won't be five seconds. Yeah. That's yeah. All. yeah. So get it fixed before then by the lawyers. I think I, I really lean toward Mr. Wall's solution because I think the next two are quite different than this one. So to give you kind of a feel tonight of the first one, which is really, as I said, a very Plain standard. Okay. Yeah. Versus the next ones, which have to do with leases. So. If the board is comfortable, um, we could move on and, and talk, talk about the other two and see um, if you're comfortable yes. doing. We could revise the motions very quickly for your meeting on the 20th, and it could be a very quick vote on the 20th with the chairs. If that's the motion. pleasure of the board, yes, but you, you heard my concern. Yeah, Ms. Brewer. Um, a, as we get into this, could someone clarify usually I don't have this much trouble following these but does it make sense that almost but not quite the first two motions are identical referring to the same parcel numbers because there are two different issues going on because otherwise they're the exact same parcel numbers 2d1 no, 2b3 and 2b5 right here it says no, they're different. 2, 2d1 and 2d1 2d14 2D1 is listed in both. So is 2B5. Uh oh. That's my point. I'm not just making this up. But there's other. But they aren't identical. There's no, a slight but, difference. But why would yeah. 2D1 be listed twice? Uh, why would 2B5 be listed two eight, twice? And 2A18 two two eight 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 be listed twice. Um, uh -oh. so, so that's maybe I'm thinking maybe there is an explanation for there this. There is an explanation. So in the first. Two, the action is um, related to the solar north of Pulpit Hill Road. So the solar spans multiple parcels. Uh, one of the parcels is in, let me see if I get this right here. One of them is in chapter 61 and the other is in chapter 61A for agriculture. So, um, I guess I'd, I'd rather, you know, again, I'm leaning toward Mr. Wall's uh, approach here is to explain them to you. You can ask questions. We will get the motions right for the 20th, and this should be a, a straightforward vote on the 20th. In terms of adding to your notes associated with that, all three of these motions currently say 61A. It's if, and since that's not true, based on the materials we have, one of them is 61. Uh, instead, just right. just so like look again, at all the piece I'm, parts. <laughs> just look I've at all of it. it twice. My preference would be yeah. to do it on the table. And it, not it disagreeing with that, but it's it seems like one of the other kind of technical problems here is it would be Mass General Law, Chapter 61, and then Summer Under, which is the lead on all of these, and then Summer Under 61A, Summer Under 61 Summer not in this case, but 61B. So I just wonder, our first raptor, in accordance with Mass General Law, chapter 61, because. Is that like the parent reference? Yeah, I'm not sure. That would need to be checked. Okay. Okay, and so then I just, I, I, I just have a, a I have actually a content question. Um, what had come up for me, and I, I, if we were discussing these a little more, is um, the last time I remember any conversation about this, the solar, is that considered a change of use that triggers this chapter, or is the solar use um, accounted for under Mass General Law 61 or 61A, whatever? So, so if gonna, you could, I've not yeah. been able to give my No, no, I know, I know, but that, okay, <laughs> so, but I know we're on the technical, but I wanted to make sure you motions. could talk about that a little, yeah. Right. We're not going to do them tonight. So I why don't you tell us about them, yeah, right. <laughs> separate from the motions that we yeah, yes. will then unpack next time. But anyway, if you would go through those other two pieces so of property, yeah. which In are a little summary, more In summary, 4A, triple I, again, is a, should be a straightforward 61 yeah. request right. for, um, uh, and, a, and a recommendation not to exercise. Uh, 4AI and 4AII 
also come with recommendations from the Planning Board and the Conservation Commission not to exercise the town's right of first refusal, but they are significantly different. And both have to do with the solar project that is actually under construction north of uh, Pulpit Hill Road. And so I guess I'd start by saying that communities all over Massachusetts are um, learning as we go relative to solar. And the state, as you know, is encouraging solar production, solar development um, as part of their energy goals for the next you know, 20 years. And um, not unlike marijuana regulations and process, we are learning as we go with regard to solar. So um, again, without getting into dates and all of that, um, this entire process started somewhat late we were noticed late because in fact the solar project had already gone through town processes including the conservation commission uh, planning board etc for the project north of uh, pulpit hill road so in answer to miss kruger's question um, solar on chapter 61 61a or 61b land is considered a conversion so we must, the town municipality must be noticed of that conversion. And a couple of things happen. We are entitled to um, a right of first refusal and we are entitled to back taxes. Um, what's interesting and different about this, if you had an opportunity to read your packets, is there's no, there's no purchase price. This is not a sale. This is a conversion and a lease. So the, the question it begs is, do we have the right to step into the lease? No, we don't. We are not given the opportunity to step into the lease. We are given the opportunity to purchase the property. And in order to do that, a couple of things need to take place. One is we're still held to the 120 day notice. And number two, it would require any municipality, immersed or another, to do a couple of things. One would be to get an appraisal. Mm -hmm. And third, uh, secondly, would likely the owner of the property would likely get an appraisal and see where those two numbers fall. We would then need to enter into a purchase and sale agreement and at least, at the very least, enter a purchase and sale agreement um, and likely even buy the land in 120 days. But that's a little bit murky. <laughs> so that's the clear difference here is that Coles is offering a lease to a company that triggers the right, the 61, 61A, 61B process, and we have the opportunity to step in to purchase the property, not lease the property. Now, this one is a little bit more complicated. We will get a little more information on how the parcels lay out relative to 61 and 61A in this case, um, because the property, some of the property will remain in forest production. So in that case, our assessor has to get information from the state forester in order for the land to, let's say, um, this is about a 50 acre piece of property and the solar is gonna go on 25 to 30, can the remaining land stay in chapter? That question has to be answered by the state forester. If the land that is excluded from the solar project is still, um, uh, uh, timber land, uh, forest land that can be harvested, then in all likelihood that remaining part of the property um, can be uh, left in chapter. The other land would be taken out of chapter and taxed accordingly. So that's where we are, um, separate from motions that we <laughs> clearly need to work on. Um, so that's, we don't know. That's yeah. where we are. Again, the recommendation coming from staff is that we not exercise our right of first refusal on any one of the three of these. We can get the motions right for a very quick um, vote at your meeting on the 20th. If there are questions, I'd be happy to take them. We've been in consultation with, obviously, uh, David Burgess has been around the table on this and Shireen Everett from Copeland and Page on the content and the, uh, the nuances of how we deal with solar. But it is a little bit of a new and evolving um, uh, landscape out there for solar and 61. So the question I have is in, in the circumstance where the parcels are, are 
uh, if the forester comes back and says, yes, you can keep part of the property in, in forest and therefore still within chapter 61 or 61A, whichever applies, um, would you then essentially subdivide the parcels so as to dis delineate those different pieces so that it can be assessed properly and, 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 uh, and it's clear where those boundaries lie? Is that what the process would involve at that point? Yeah, my understanding is the landowner would have to come back with a forest management plan that would outline what part of the parcel is going to remain in forestry. It needs to be a minimum of five acres. Um, and in this case, I spoke to Mr. Burgess earlier today. In this case, he thought Coles would likely come back and say that the remaining part of the parcel, um, again, with input from the state forester, would they would like to keep in, in chapter for forestry. But again, our action is going to be whether to buy it or not buy it. And we're, the recommendation we're, is not to purchase. And, and we're so therefore, only, then everything else can happen after the fact as far as the slicing of the property for the purposes of tax purposes. And I spoke to Sharon Everett about this earlier today. And really, we are only able to step in to buy that piece of the property that is being converted. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a new... Mm -hmm horizon for us as well. So it is not the whole parcel. It is only that part that is going for solar, being converted to solar. So I apologize for, for the motions. We will work on those. But I wanted you to understand the difference between a very traditional Chapter 61 and this, which I believe is the first one that has come before the board, at least in my time with the town. Is there further comment or question on, on these two? Yes. Part of the reason I found this so confusing is I have at least three pages that are duplicates of other pages, which at first I didn't think was true, but really is true. <laughs> and so um, this was a lot of material all at once. And so it's not surprising that some things didn't quite get gelled up the way they'd intended to. But yes, reflecting way back to the beginning of our conversation, if we show the approximate acreage and we make clear which ones are 61 and which ones are 61A, then hopefully we can finish this clearly. What I, what I would suggest is that perhaps if you, um, before we meet on the 20th, if you get the motions ahead of that, yeah, that would be. would be helpful. I mean, more than just our usual notice, if you get the language from council um, and you could share that out or any other materials along the way that, that could sort of paint the picture for us so as to make that part of our meeting on Monday go quicker, more quickly, that would be helpful. Yes. Um, I think it also would be good in the motion um, yet to be written to reference the conversion of land for solar or something that gives a little more context or content to this, because then when you go back, I think it has, it, it's helpful. It may not be legally required, but I think it would be helpful to explain that. And um, Yes, Mr. Wall. Yeah, and similar, that's a good point. And you know, it's to maybe echo Mr. Steinberg's point for future reference institutional memory too, if someone wants to go back and say, did we ever do a, a lease as opposed, you know, if it just has the 61 and the parcel, it tells us nothing, it'll help the future. Uh, totally minor point, this really requires a magnifying glass for me. I mean, we're not <laughs> studying the maps in detail and debating the things, but for future reference, you know, if we're actually supposed to do something with the maps larger is sometimes advisable. Mr. Steinberg. Yeah, um, as far as the wording of the motion is concerned, I, at this point, uh, I'm not sure that I would want to include things in the motion unless we've been advised by council that it makes sense because that's what you have minutes for at times is to um, put the motion in context. Um, but we don't want the motion to be more than we're legally required to have unless we've been advised that it's um, um, okay to do that. And uh, so I would, um, you know, this is one that uh, I'd probably uh, be inclined to ask Ms. Everett about, um, Attorney Everett. Um, the, um, the cool thing about the map, I appreciate your comment on that. Um, the, what I missed on the map was that if there had been a larger map that showed Pulpit Hill Road in a larger context and the placement of 
this land, I would know what I was looking at, but it was really hard to do that given what the map was as well as the size. So. Just uh, because when I suggested adding that language, Mr. Steinberg looked unnoticeably pained. I was not suggesting it wouldn't be reviewed by council because we had already said that our motions would be reviewed by council. So of course, addition would then be approved by Ms. Everett or she to see that potential addition. Not sneaking Just anything in. <laughs> a quick comment on the maps. So clearly these are, I'm not sure if the board is aware, they're not our maps. These are the maps required of the applicant. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess in future, uh, we could ask the applicant um, to provide larger contextual maps. It just creates a lot of work for staff if right. we're actually creating a contextual map for all three of these. Uh, and then we get into the detail of where is the solar going on the, the various parcels, which is really, they have all that information. It's all in engineering drawings. So. Um, um, yeah, we could we could ask the applicant. Yeah. And I guess my last point to make is that uh, the next time this comes up, it might be before a different um, body than the select board. And uh, so anything that we learn from this experience can help in how we're going to inform um, a council if they're the ones who are making that decision as to how the decision is being made. I'm assuming that it's a council decision, but uh, leave that to others to figure out. It's like going into our big guidance book. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Mr. Zomek, since he so enjoyed explaining this to us earlier, to try one more time to explain to me why it is that two of these motions list three that all the parcels in the current second motion are also in the first motion, but not exclusively mm -hmm. also in the first motion. No, he's starting to tell us. I'm and I got lost. To, for the sake of time, <laughs> I don't. Just don't try. Why would we do that tonight? <laughs> That's and, fine. And spend the, the, the select board's time tonight if I could. Let's just, Maybe we'll work on a, those motions again. Maybe there could just be a couple sentences that explain that. That won't be part of and the motion. Right, we will. Right, we will determine that. It's just confusing. Can two parcels be in 61 and 61A? I would assume they could not. Parts of parcels can be in 61 oh. and 61A. Simultaneously? Yeah. Parts of part, yeah. <laughs> it can't be, so. Okay. So that can be clarified. I'm just curious. That was not to, don't belabor the point, but I did anyway, so. <laughs> Uh, so I think we're ready to, unless there's other comment or question on this, I think we're ready to move move forward with this uh, our agenda a little bit. Uh, so next up we have uh, a charter transition update or topics for future council consideration. Um, I guess in some senses we've sort of touched on that second one a little bit relative to chapter 61. <laughs> um, but I think um, actually speaking of that as well, um, we were talking earlier about uh, licensing of, of temporary licenses, and so that might be a piece of advice as well to sort of share with them. As, um, hold on, let me make a note. I'll recognize you. Yes. At the risk of sounding abrupt, what good is it to write that note? on your agenda from the standpoint of we talked a couple times ago about the idea of a Google Doc, some piece of paper that we could add to a clipboard. I mean, I don't care how low tech or high tech we need to go, but we just keep spinning it out here at meetings yeah, and I maybe haven't. it makes the minutes and maybe it doesn't. And I, I just, I'm not feeling it as so being a, a way to approach It's a matter this. of getting to it, which I haven't yet, so. But, uh, and I don't mean to imply it should all be on you. No. I mean, well, that, that's what Once Mr. I get the frame Bockle in place, then it'll, be on, it'll be on all of us at that point. But, but, but uh, to understand how we could start filling that in, because if we just keep tossing out ideas, and I'm not really sure who's catching them, so. Right. No, that's a, a point well taken, and, and, you know, wishes were nickel, we'd all be rich. But, <laughs> um, no, it's, it's an area that I, I definitely want to get the, the beginnings of started and then get it shared out to you guys so that we can be more concrete in in sort of putting those together um to that end mr Slaughter, yes perhaps we, sh we could pick a meeting date and say that's going to be on the agenda of 
won't date because then we have a fixed deadline and it's something. Yes, a deadlines, document and, uh, deadlines are always good. Uh, and like after, you know, we finish the review and. Can we say the 5th of September? Wednesday meeting. The Wednesday, Wednesday meeting, meeting, the first of two in a row. We'll have a thing to start looking at. Yep. And uh, I can draft the list for council. So, there, that will help. Yes, Ms. Brewer. Did you want to talk about the meeting schedule in a different context, or would it be okay to bring it up now? Uh, now we'll be fine. Now would be fine. So we have this beautiful new schedule. My question is, given that the charter states that the town council will be sworn in by noon on Monday, December 3rd, I don't understand how we're having a meeting that night. So we're probably not having a meeting that night. So uh, we <laughs> will have a meeting. We will have, talk about that in just a second. We will have a meeting that day. So I've had a brief conversation with the manager a little bit about this, and, and actually at agenda setting we talked about this a little bit. It's likely there may be some actual real business to be done on the 3rd. There will be some license renewal or common vic or something like that. So we might have a very brief um, morning meeting and then a more ceremonial passing of the torch, as it were, at noon, which is when the council actually takes uh, takes office, and then, uh, but you know, those deta details are still open for conversation. So, yes. so maybe we could talk about that for a moment, associated sure. with the charter transition, because we're not all at agenda setting, obviously, and I don't want to have a big party discussion as being one of our necessary agenda topics, perhaps between now and then, and I can happily leave that to agenda setting largely, but. I think it's important that we publish on this schedule, which does get posted a couple of places down t around town hall, that we're not meeting that night. We are simply not meeting that night. It's gonna have to be a day meeting, so I think we should work out soon when we can attend that, and it's going to be during the day on a Monday prior to noon, and we also, at this point, I believe, unless Mr. Bachman's already decided, we don't know when the inauguration, so to speak, of the counselors is. It just has to be before noon. So if it's at 11, 11.55, 8.30 a.m., I don't know. But hopefully, it, well, it seems it would have to be after whatever select board meeting it is that we're having that day. So I would just ask that you guys work that out and let us know fairly soon. Right, so it, it, it has been mentioned and thought about not in any great detail. I, not only, I think it might note before noon, but actually we would finish before noon when we sort of, you know, go off and become fairies or whatever. We don't know if the council will actually adjourn their meeting at noon or in the evening. No, they, we, have, they have to be sworn before they, they noon, and we are surely not going to just trot them in front of the town clerk's can, office to raise their hands and well, call that done. excuse me, we don't really know what we're doing, but... I think that would be. I point. think our business, first of all, is to figure out our meeting schedule to conclude our work before that, so Indeed. we can make a note, and then the rest of it will sort of unfold, and we should be part of planning something that could be a little more ceremonial, and it may have to do with when the swearing. It, it may be around the swearing in or whatever that is, but sort of two. I'm just saying to separate. We have to finish our work, and we're reserving that morning if there's some straggling things that might hold somebody up the license, then we would voluntarily participate in some kind of more ceremonial part of a transition between this board and the council being sworn in, or I call it seated, but sworn in, and that has to get figured out, and maybe we assign that to you know one or two members to think about along with the manager. But it's like I'm just trying to separate the two things. I appreciate that. I just don't want the audience to walk away thinking that the inauguration happens at noon and we have until noon to figure this out. We don't. We have to figure it out. We, I assume we should decide we're going to meet at 8 or 8.30 that day, be done with it, and know that the inauguration will take place, the commit swearing in. Right. So it doesn't have to be a big ceremony, but I assume it'll be kind of something, and that'll happen, but it has to have happened by noon. That's all I'm trying so, to get across. Right. I'm just, it's, it's a little silly to belabor, belabor this now, but say we know we have a very light agenda of two items and there's an event 
around the swearing in at noon. We might want to meet at 11 so we could be here for that and not come in at 8.30 <laughs> and then have to leave and come back. So I think there's a logistical piece that we can't figure out right now. But it is being thought of, let me put it that way. Um, but I think you're right, though, that given that that would not be a typical evening meeting, yes, it's, we it's need worth to noting that that needs somehow. to be identified as such. And it's so not a regular meeting either, not, and so that needs to be crossed off. Right. It just needs to say final. Are we talking? Irregular. <laughs> yes. Put IR in front of We're talking about ending sometime <laughs> well prior to noon. Sure. So that Because I assume it'll take at least five minutes to read to the <clears throat> 13 counselors they're swearing in even if we don't do a big ceremony, which is going to be up to who? Who's it up to as to what that ceremony looks like? Us and the manager, I suppose. Mostly the manager, because it's, it's his council to work with. So. Party planner. That's right. Yeah. I think we will take on that sooner so than we'll later. So we'll just mark down here that it's not a regular meeting. Right. It's Sometime prior to noon, completed prior to noon. Right. Right. Yes. Probably as early as the 20th, we'll have that changed. So, speaking of the uh, what we're doing on the 20th, uh, the next item on our agenda, unless there's further things or anything that you needed to mention relative to the other topics under charter transition, um, the town manager performance review, fiscal year 19 goals. I want to express my thanks to Ms. Brewer for having taken our fiscal 18 goals and done some editing to offer us something to work from. So in our packet is, is, um, is a uh, fiscal 19 performance goals in draft form um, that we can begin discussing and hopefully getting, um, I think one of the key points that, that she that Ms. Burr share, shared with me is that, you know, if you start counting how many meetings we have left, Ms. Burr mentioned this earlier off, off, uh, off camera, is, uh, there's not a lot of meetings left. And so, you know, when we start to set goals or, or try to shape what's happening over the next three months, really, um, we have to be fairly focused on concrete tasks that we're asking the manager to do and then potentially providing uh, our suggestions and advice relative to the rest of the fiscal year and the, uh, to the council. Um, so I thought as, as people have looked this over, hopefully over the weekend, that they may have comments or suggestions relative to this document to get us started. Um, I didn't think we'd necessarily vote it tonight, but if we get so motivated, obviously I would not be opposed to that, but um, people had comments or questions and concerns about it. Oh, the red line version. There the is a red line version, version kind of yeah, in the appendix. Where, way in the back, there's a red line version of this. But. I know, I saw it, yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. <coughs> the red line version. Yeah. yeah okay. So we can take a moment to look it over. So basically, if I might. Yes. I, I didn't change anything after, um, so basically on page two of the red line version, you can see when it starts fiscal management, those are just exactly what the goals were right. that we just evaluated him right. on. Those didn't change. It's just the preface to that that's different. Right. So I didn't sneak anything in there to change any of that wording.
Do you want the red line one? Yeah, just some help this part. It's not the right thing. section. Here. No, oh, that's the weird one. Yeah. While, while my colleagues are reading, I'm going to ask the, the assistant town manager a quick question uh, relative to the um, one of the points in here, the MassWorks grant. Is there a is that a rolling application process, or is there or are there specific deadlines for MassWork grants? Uh, no, there is a specific deadline, which I was going to inform the board about it. it was last Friday, but yes, every year in August, uh, MassWorks publishes a check accomplished. <laughs> we submitted our grant on Friday. Um, oh, I can tell you more about that in a few minutes. Okay. Sorry, we have to cross it off. We can is just say it's it? done. Which, which number is it? It's B, A1B. A1B. Oh. It's on the front page. I, I read it. Um, right. In my, I think it's submit, not resubmit. Well, because it's you don't take the same application. It doesn't matter. It's done. It's done. Moved. So it will be an accomplishment. We've already got one accomplishment. <laughs> I wouldn't take it out because it said in the. Yes. The reason I said it that way is because I thought the deadline was this month. But the reason I said it that way was so that the town manager could take credit for something he said he was hoping to do in his year-end review. Right. And rather than just being like, oh, the things he said he was going to do, who cares, unless he hasn't done them yet. It's like, hey, I was hoping you would say. <laughs> we re or that there was a reason that we hadn't, and that would have dealt with it as well. So I have two. Uh, 3A, update select board on continued implementation. I think there's. Yep. There's a typo. One, and then, aha, 5F. Wrong town council. No way. Siri let me down. Yes, it sure is. Bonus points for me. And then yeah. a, a little more on content. Um, well, we talk about um, you know the appropriate relationship with this one and that one. What about appropriate relationship with the campus community coalition? This is another one with select boards represented and without mm -hmm. a select board. I, you know, it's not as major as some of these other ones, but I would want to add that to the list. The same so kind sort of, language. of between like C and D or D and uh, would it, yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah, throw it in there, and you can. And it's you know, the it's technically the UMass Community Campus and Community Coalition. Yeah, Campus Community Coalition. Since it's a coalition, it's not UMass, but it shouldn't say UMass. Amherst okay. Campus Community Coalition to something, something, something under age drinking. And there's no reference in here to the Regional School District Planning Board that's currently working uh, between, with uh, the planning committees of Amherst and Pelham on elementary. Hmm. Good. You know, I wonder why I didn't pick that up from the other. Because it may have been a process that was too new a year ago. Um, this right. has really moved yeah. along Where since then. Does it go Five. under fiscal or does it go under long range? Well, it might you be. pick. Because <laughs> under fiscal is where we have the assessment method because that's pretty short term as well as long term. But does it belong, given that the other is talking, long range is currently talking about the charter transition plan and Fort River School feasibility study, maybe that's the right place for the, is it the regional school district planning board Pelham and Amherst, right? Yes, probably, because there are no, actually there are a number of issues that I know that uh, Mr. Bachman's already working on relative to that process, because uh, there's a bunch of legal issues that come up. What words would you like beyond coordinated planning and resource allocation, something along those lines? So what what would be good words? Support, long update, select board on the action. I mean, he's going to keep doing it. But we'd yeah. want to hear about it. Um, 
or is he just supporting it? I think that it's a little bit of both. Uh, provide support to the regional school district planning board as appropriate and um, it, including updating it, select and board? update the select board and like I said in B town council after well, it's probably in B. That December. It's not in the short term. Okay, I just want to make sure there weren't any other technical words I needed in there other than. Oh, I think. That I think I could literally just copy B and say instead of Fort River School feasibility, say Regional School District Planning Board. For yeah, I think that the most the important thing is just to put it on the radar screen, is an item. Do you want to say pre-K to six, or should we just just we say elementary? We should probably say something. You could say you could you could go either way. PK to six is fine. Well, I may just be tired. I'm looking at three long range planning number five down here. Oh, I don't take any responsibility for those. Those are the the shears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nope, not taking any responsibility <laughs> for that. Many more so than you are. Those are the ones we already had. You were talking about the preparing materials yeah. in advance. Yeah, that, that, I'm not cross, I didn't cross anything out. Okay. What my point was is here's the cover. Right. For the, for the eval, you guys figure out mm -hmm. what it is you want to do. We're, this, in theory, these are the short term goals we agreed to between now and the time the town council takes effect. After that, rather than saying go find them, mm -hmm. we'll say here they are, do what you want with them, see if you think it's done. Some of them might be done, some of them not. Thanks for doing this. Yes, greatly appreciated. Let me know what it is. What I would suggest for us relative to this um, is that. Uh, <coughs> would be so kind as to add the edits that have been suggested I can do that and then share that back with us and then if if we have additional sort of comments or whatever we can funnel those back to you and oh. then we'll put it won't take it up on the 20th but perhaps um, <laughs> would it be the fifth or would we do it when are we supposed to talk about this? sure look at Look at an actual timeline. This, the 20th. The packet for the select board meeting will include FY19 goals. Right. Do we vote them that evening? And then we Monday the 20th, we continue the discussion. And we can do it then or not, depending on how complicated it gets. Some years we drug it out to November. Right. No, exactly. <laughs> Probably not a good year to do that. Right, not a good year to do that. <laughs> yes. If one of us did send Ms. Brewer a change, and that would be before we got to talk about it, if you could, you know, with color or whatever, just show that as a suggestion so that it would come back for inclusion, you know, a decision of the whole if there was a new one. Right. I think uh, the question I'm having is I, I think when, when should we have a conversation about uh, taking action on them? Do we think we want to do that on the 20th when we read all like of the evaluations? The third looks <laughs> <laughs> or do we want to wait till the 24th? Or do we want to yeah, wait yeah. till the 5th when we have an evening meeting more like our usual meeting? So what I'd, what I'd like to do since I have one part of this is I would like to go ahead and make those edits tomorrow when I have access to the same platform I had to use done it on originally and get that back out to you. And then I think it could be in the packet for next week well, yeah, and then well, if we use it or we don't right mm -hmm. I mean I definitely would want to put right. it in the packet for next week I just to know to just try to get a sense of the the board about whether they want to take action on it that quickly or it may depend on how the evening's conversation goes if, relative if I get it back to you tomorrow and then they come up with six more ideas out right Not like me, but. all right well what we'll do is we'll Ms. Brewer will make the edits thank you very much for that and share those back out with us and we'll make sure to include it in the packet for the 20th and we'll go from there but um, barring any other comments or suggestions at the moment, I think we can potentially move ahead with our agenda. So, um, so next up we have uh, committee boards appointments and reappointments. We have um, a confirmation of a couple of appointments by the manager. 
Um, and I didn't know if, if we needed a little intro on that from someone who might have participated in the uh, interview process relative to those appointments or if we just want to take our motion and move on or find the right piece of paper. Here it is. So these are appointments made by the manager that we confirm. Um, I'm going to bring this up for Ms. Mills' benefit. Um, we usually don't put CAF in, but if we do, we try to redact any personal information. So in the electronic one, if you can, or if you didn't post it, then sort of block out those things that are sort of personal information, but um, which you may have done. I didn't look at the electronic version. So thank you if you did. Um, could, could I follow yes. up on that? I believe what we traditionally did, and I don't know because I didn't check the electronic packet, so this may be what we already did, but I believe what we traditionally do is we have to list the name in our list of topics because right. for 48 hours notice based on the most recent open meeting law revision, but we have only included the CAF in our paper packet. We have right. not uploaded it, period. No it's redaction. Fine. It just doesn't get uploaded. Ms. Mills is uh, nodding, us, nodding yes that that's what And happened. so then we're fine. Okay, not good. Completely. Okay. So unless there's comments relative to these, yeah. right. it's just chain of motion. So why don't you tell, tell people why we're appointing it? Like, that would be good. Because it's unusual at this stage. For us I think that, uh, I'll kind of repeat it, though. I believe that it's in uh, Mr. Bachelman's uh, memorandum, too, which is uh, probably in the packet, both online and otherwise. But... Uh, we are very conscious of the fact that um, we are not making appointments to um, boards and committees unless it is to bring the um, number to the point where you have a quorum plus one so that the committee's boards can continue to function. And uh, this particular board is in that situation in the historical commission it is important that it be able to meet because um, it uh, could have um, a historical a, a uh, question of demolition or some other issue that might might arise um, so uh, I'll um, actually say one other thing in relation to another committee um, and then we, but we can take it up for discussion separately only if people wish to, that the Public Arts Commission is in a very similar space. And um, as far as I'm aware um, now, Mr. Wald is the select board member who is the um, liaison to that committee um, along with the committee chair. And Mr. Bachleman will be uh, interviewing people who have submitted CAFs and it's exactly the same process that I just described that caused us to make the decision to go ahead with that appointment process. I have a question about term length. I believe, based on our previous discussions, and we obviously went around about this for a while when we were talking, especially at meetings prior to town meeting, which were, of course, also televised, just like these, about how long we should extend committee appointments for, et cetera. I believe that I don't personally care how long this term length is because it's entirely up to the council and the town manager to sort that out later. So if they get to a committee where they feel like they need some change, there's, I don't believe that there's any, I don't think we're putting the, we're binding the council or the town manager in any way by saying it's to 2021. If they decide later that they don't want the terms to last, if they want to stop a committee if they want to make a committee different, et cetera, I think they have those options. So what I'm saying is I don't think we need to sweat the length of the term at this point, and given the council will have so many other things in front of them, and given that, in fact, the historical commission is one of the things that actually is required that we have, um, and so is much less likely to be subject to a, eh, we don't really need that anymore conversation, um, I, I'm not concerned with the term length, and so I think 2021 is perfectly reasonable and under those conditions. 
Sure. Um, just to go along with how uh, contrary <coughs> I've been tonight. Um, I think it's awkward to um, change somebody's position if they have, the, I think the expectations for the appointee on a longer term are different where people could get offended or have different expectations, and I think it's more awkward if there were a restructuring or a change of membership to have people who just got appointed for three years. I would be more comfortable with going to 2019 or maybe even at most 2020. Um, yeah, I understand that this is a committee we have to have. I don't expect it to be done away with, but I think that we may be going beyond um, what we should be doing. And this is not about these mem these particular people being suggested at all, but I am uncomfortable with going to the full three-year term. Almost three years. Mr. Walter, Mr. Steinberg, do you have an opinion about that? Well, the uh, charter provides that um, um, all committees except for a couple of ones that are specifically named, of which the two I've just mentioned are not among that list. Mm -hmm. Um, that appointments are made by the town manager subject to um, submission to the uh, council, which then has the right to uh, say no, uh, I think is essentially what it is. Um, and that's the purpose of this whole um, transition provision is so that they have that opportunity to look at what the appointments are and say, hey, wait a minute, I have a problem with this particular proposal. Um, going out to the length of time then becomes problematic because I think that it frustrates the uh, council's ability to provide that oversight over appointments and confirmation of appointments that was, you know, a part of the charter that was just adopted by the voters. So I think I would tend to go a little bit, I, I, I'm sure I certainly would go until June 30 of 19 because I think it would take that long for the council to get to this kind of a thing. But um, there's, uh, going out this length of time seems to be a little awkward, a little overreach beyond uh, what the transition provision was envisioning. Mr. Wall? In the interest of full disclosure, I should also note that I'm related by marriage to the chair of the commission. But, <clears throat> I mean, I have, so I have no preference as far as the length of term. I guess I'll just say two things. I mean, number one, the town manager says he allows us to change it if we think it fit and that you know there's often a learning curve for these things um in this case we have two very well qualified candidates very different in background but both knowledgeable and both quick studies so i think they would get up to speed uh i think they'd be up to speed a lot faster than the council will be council will be uh so i don't know i guess i'm trying to ask myself in my hypothetical scenario what would move the council to reduce a term if we said it uh unless it simply wants, simply wants to have direct control over things, but since it's a town manager appointment, uh, I'm just having trouble imagining why the council would wish to change it, but that's just for whatever it's worth. The main thing right now is to have competent people who can do the job, for example, if demolition hearings come up and so forth, and I'm confident these people could, so that's, that's good for the short term, either way. Ms. Brewer. And absolutely emphasizing again that these are excellent appointments and we are not in any way talking about the people, we're talking about the spots. And right. so I know that's awkward when your name's on something, but we're really not talking about you, we're talking about spots. And I think that this comes down to one of those questions that's gonna just have to be sorted out to a large degree. We can make some decision here, we have to, but then the real nuance of it is gonna be sorted out by the council because just like Framingham went through a transition, slightly different because they have a mayor, but they went through a transition where it said that they had to, that the <coughs> council had to approve the mayor's appointments. And so, but what does that mean, really? Because does that mean that the mayor puts down a name and says, I want this person? Does that say the mayor puts down a name and a three-page resume and why this person's better than 15 other people? Or in some cases, the counselors thought it should behoove them to go off and Google the other possible candidates for that sort of thing. So 
it's all like a cultural thing, I think, to some degree, when it's not laid out in the charter as to how those decisions are going to, what that council is going to decide to do. It does seem in a, in a commission like this, it would be especially foolish given the learning and the legal nature of what they're doing for the council to say, you know, that historical commission, we want to take a look at that whole thing. Let's just blow it up and start over. Mr. Town Manager, you can bring us back some of the same people, but we want to, we want to make sure we vet all of them. We didn't expire all the committee appointments, right? And it didn't tell us we had to expire all the committee appointments. So given just all that and that, unlike so many things we do when we can say we did this for a very definitive reason, this is a little gray out there and it's going to be up to the council how to work with the manager on how to interpret it so I'm fine with going shorter as well having broached this by saying I was fine with going longer and I would hope that June 30th 2019 would give enough time if that's the decision that then the town manager you know say long about February or something would be thinking oh these people are working out great I want to make sure I get their names into the town council to continue beyond that because otherwise we may wind up back in the same boat with not having enough people to do things because we don't have in front of us how many other historical commission members might have their terms expiring on June 30th of 2019 or might move out of town like people do etc so I appreciating all the complexity of this and not wanting to leave anybody in the lurch, but yet not wanting to frustrate the purpose of the council getting to vet appointments. I'm, I'm basically fine with anything. So you guys <laughs> come up with something that works for you. I get it. Well, just to respond, I think Mr. Wald's point about um, the learning curve is a good one, but I think by making it shorter, I, I would have quite reasonable expectation that people would continue after that. We, we most often reappoint, you know, whoever the body is, <clears throat> I think the likelihood of reappointment is large. So I'm not discounting the learning curve because it, it doesn't mean you're fired after, um, it, if, if it were to be um, June 30th, 2019, which I, I guess that's probably how I would frame the motion <laughs> unless people really do object to that. Would you like to make that motion? Sure. Um, I move to confirm the town manager's appointment of Patricia Oth and Robin Fordham to the Historical Commission for terms ending June 30th, 2019. And I, 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 should there be like a comma or is that for terms ending it? It should have been a comma and a small f. Yes. So that's how I read it. I read it comma small f. Yeah. That's what I heard you say. <laughs> I heard the comma. And there's a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous. Thank you to everyone who applied. Yes, absolutely. Um, we have on our agenda the bylaw review committee. Is there any news relative to that that you know of, Mr. Mr. Uh, no updates okay. that I have tonight. All right. And so next we come into, let me make sure we're, we're at, we have approval of minutes, which we could do now if we want to take that up or we could go into our town manager and select board member reports. Shall we do minutes just to sort of finish motions? Anyone? <laughs> just Heimberg, did you want to offer any comment relative to the minutes that are available to us? No, I uh, submitted corrections or suggested corrections and uh, they were made and uh, they're incorporated in what you see. And uh, nothing else to say. All right. Would you like to make a motion? <laughs> That's yeah, okay. I'll just, uh, I move to approve the minutes for the following select board meetings May 14, 2018, May 16, 2018, May 20. 1, 2018 and June 15, 2018 as presented. Is there a second? All right, so we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? One abstention? Thank you. And there so are about a dozen more that have been sent to me for review, so yeah. that um, as fast as I can get to them, I will get them and turn them out, but not for next week when we don't want to add to the agenda. <laughs> <That's right. Yeah. laughs> so again, that was a vote of four to zero with one abstention. So All right, so I think from the formal sort of motions, if the marks on my paper are correct, we're down to 
reports and comments. So the town manager report, or in this case, the assistant town manager report, or the acting, acting. Town manager report. Would you like to take us through a few things? Sure. Um, acknowledging the hour, what I thought I would do is is just um, take this opportunity to to uh, highlight a couple of projects that the town is working on, and um, happy to take questions. Maybe at the end we can jump back, but um, love. An image is worth a thousand words, so I thought we'd quickly run through some images here and I could illustrate where we are in certain projects. I know the board is well aware of our dog park uh, plans for the old landfill off of um, uh, Old Belchtown Road. You uh, were made aware that we received a $25,000 Stanton Foundation grant recently. I just received the check uh, today, as a matter of fact. So um, that is excellent news. It really puts us in the pipeline, if you will, with the Stanton Foundation for bigger money and the construction grant. Surprised you didn't bring a blow up of the check, David. Uh, it's, it's about <laughs> this big, but it, it's, it, I, I don't think it'll bounce. Um, the Stanton Foundation grant that we will be going for is, is in the order of $200,000, $220,000, in that neighborhood. Um, the next steps are that we will be engaging um, an engineering firm to do what's um, uh, layperson's understanding is a reuse study. Essentially, we need to look at that section of the landfill and make sure that it is okay for the purpose we intend it to be. Um, I spoke to Mr. Mooring, uh, Mr. Skeels. Uh, we are quite confident, but uh, DEP requires us to do this study. As I've said before in public meetings, that section of the old landfill was actually the stump dump, so there is no refuse under that section. It is all organic material. So we think, and that's one of the reasons, that's one of the, the criteria we used, is this a safe place for dogs and people to recreate? They've been doing that informally for many, many years, but that section is, um, uh, we think, a very appropriate place. So we're lined up with Stanton. Uh, we are in the process of contracting with Berkshire Design Group out of Northampton. They have uh, worked successfully with the Stanton Foundation a number of times. They have de de uh, developed a number of dog parks. Uh, Peter Wells and his team, uh, we feel very confident. Uh, they developed this conceptual design, which we will now take to a full design. In total, we're talking about two acres maximum. Uh, the biggest challenge for me and for town staff will be how do we coordinate this process with the solar landfill process at the new landfill across the street near the transfer station? And how do we design this park so that it can work with our bird conservation area that's being required by the state. So as you know, most of the land, uh, th this, this uh, uh, concept you're looking at, um, if you can envision the highest part of the old landfill being at the top of the slide, that's facing due uh, west. So all the rest, well, most of the rest of the landfill will be in this bird conservation area, fenced. Excluded from that will be the dog park the sledding hill, if you will, to the south, and the Robert Frost Trail to the south. So the entire cap of the landfill needs to be fenced and will be essentially um, grassland bird habitat for the grasshopper sparrow and any other um, uh, grassland birds. So we're excited. We envision a planning process, a public planning process, um, uh, spearheaded um, by the Doug, Por uh, Doug Park Task Force, with staff support, taking until January or February, and then our hope is to put it out to bid in late winter, uh, and a goal would be to be under construction late summer, early fall of 19. So that, that's the quick, the quick synopsis. We're really excited about it. Keep in mind there is $90,000 the town meeting authorized through CPA to match the money from coming from Stanton, so we'll be working very closely with Stanton. Um, the, the, my contact at the Stanton Foundation, uh, I believe they have something on the order of 40 dog parks going at once right now throughout the state. So um, uh, they were very impressed with our application, very impressed with our site selection, and very impressed with the process that uh, Jim Pistrang as chair and the dog park task force have done. So kudos to them. Uh, moving along, uh, going north. Um, <laughs> Let me say a bit about study of Buffer's Pond, and then I'll, I'll say a bit about the press release that we sent out uh, to you and, and via uh, social media today. So um, 
We are uh, in the beginning stages of uh, doing data collection up at Puffer's Pond. This is a picture of the UMass Geosciences uh, um, 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 graduate students uh, and staff uh, working with Beth Wilson, our wetlands administrator, to begin the process of gathering uh, and cre creating a bathymetry study. Essentially, we want to know how deep is the pond, the entire pond, and most importantly, how deep is the sediment? Um, this is all in anticipation of coming to the town and uh, in the, the coming years and finally getting to this question of when are we going to dredge? How much is it going to cost to dredge? What's the process to dredge? Uh, we have about $25,000 that town meeting approved a few years ago, and we will be using that money to um, uh, get all of the pre-permitting work done. Uh, fortunately, this uh, work that is being done by UMass is coming to us as an in-kind donation, so we're saving potentially some thousands of dollars by having UMass do it with us, uh, and they're using it in their classwork and graduate work, and uh, we are going to be the recipient of the data. Uh, we are now talking with both UMass and we'll talk with some private consultants about sampling the sediment. Um, we, of course, before we would have to dredge, we would have to sample the sediment to see if there are any heavy metals or any contaminants in the soil uh, uh, in the pond. Uh, I do know when it was uh, dredged 20 years ago uh, that they did not find any he heavy metals, which is really um, a very good thing for public health, but also a very good thing in terms of, of cost savings. So we're, we're embarking on this. I'm very excited about it. It's, it's a very small step forward, but an important one. And we'll come out with a map of both the depth of Puffer's Pond, but also the depth of sediment. Where does the Cushman Brook deposit the sediment as it enters Puffer's Pond? So a good first start. Next slide. Well, why don't we stay on Puffer's for just a second, and I'll say something about water testing. So um, I did send you an email, and we followed that up with some social media um, uh, posts today. Um, unfortunately, last week we had uh, two water samples uh, at the pond that tested um, high for E. coli bacteria levels. Uh, this was on Wednesday the 8th, and we were required to retest on the 10th. Um, those samples came back on the 10th and um, came back today. And that indicated that we, uh, for the first time in my tenure with the town, 14 years, we are required by the state to close Puffer's Pond to swimming. Um, this is not an unusual event for similar water bodies in Massachusetts. I want the public to be aware that we test Puffer's Pond weekly. This is the first time, again, in the 14 years that I've worked for the town that we have exceeded levels that required us to close it to swimming. I think the causes um, are, are primarily the uh, amount of rain that we've gotten recently, the runoff entering the Cushman Brook, and likely the turbulence that are being stirred up by the volume of water that is in puffers at this time of the year. Um, we retested uh, our, our health inspector, Susan Malone, retested the water today, as is required, and we expect results back tomorrow. My hope is that we can reopen the pond, but if it has not reached acceptable levels, then the pond will be remain closed to swimming. We've posted both beaches. Uh, if you do visit the pond, you will see very prominent signs at both the beaches and kiosks and as you enter the, um, the pond uh, parking areas. And we'll continue to work with the health department closely to make sure we do not reopen the pond until it is safe. So, um, that is where we are in Puffer's Pond. And I can come back to each one of these. I want to get through some quick updates, and then we can come back if you have questions. Um, <coughs> moving to the south, another pond that I know the select board has received a number of emails on is Markert's Pond, which is off of Pond View Drive. Is there? Is that spelled right? Nope. No. <laughs> um, it's sorry. missing R. Markert. Markert's. K-E-R-T-S. Um, yeah, Markert's Pond. Um, Market's Pond is in uh, off of Pond View Drive. It's a small pond, as you can see, but I know the select board from time to time receives a group email from concerned residents uh, who live in Orchard Valley. Uh, the good news, with all the rain and the hard work of, of the Conservation Department and the DPW, uh, last fall we installed that flow structure, which you see new flow structure, 
um, at considerable cost to the town. Uh, we installed that and it is working quite well and Orchard Valley now has a real pond for the first time, I'm told, in about 20 years. So wildlife is enjoying it, people are enjoying it. Um, there are, are, are wading birds and ducks and plenty of aquatic uh, animals. So right now we're feeling very good about that. The Conservation Department also is um, uh, doing some other improvements to the trail there. So um, again, uh, we feel very good about where, we, where we're at. We're gonna uh, meet with uh, Adrian Terizi, who is kind of the neighborhood uh, outreach uh, coordinator, volunteer, if you will. And we're gonna meet with her and the neighborhood uh, in the fall and talk about some of the other improvements we plan for the area. So Markert's Pond. Um, Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. So uh, this brings up a, a question for me relative to um, you know any number of sort of wetlands that we have, and we have a number of them around town. Um, one of the concerns that often happens, usually in the early fall, but sometimes over the summer, is, is mosquitoes and, and illness-bearing mosquitoes like West Nile virus, Triple E, which I can't remember, Eastern Equine something, um, encephalitis. You know, um, so when we have a body of water like this, is that make us more susceptible to the sort of issues with that? Not so much because we have the sort of corresponding balancing factors as far as the environment, as far as those that eat the mosquitoes, those you know, birds and aquatic life that eat the mosquitoes. Uh, you know, sort of what is uh, as we as we have these kinds of you know circumstances within our town and we create more of them by virtue of you know sort of reinstalling a or installing a, a flow structure to you know sort of reestablish something like this do, you know what what potential risks from that sort of public health standpoint do we do we run up against sure um i'd say briefly i'm not an expert on triple e nor am i an expert on mosquitoes um first of all this there has been a farm pond off and on there for the last 50 years plus. Um, I would say that the condition that the pond was in prior to us filling it was probably more of a, a mosquito breeding ground than a pond, a functioning pond with some fluctuation. So what was there was a swamp that occasionally filled and would provide, um, my guess, as much if not more breeding habitat for mosquitoes. My understanding is that Amherst has never sprayed or uh, taken an active or aggressive stance with regard to water bodies that might hold uh, breeding mosquitoes. Um, it's really um, um, kind of a blessing and a curse that Amherst has so much water. The blessing is we have a lot of water. We have beautiful water bodies. We have the Mill River and the Fort River and all of their tributaries. Um, and those provide benefits uh, all over town. Um, the, the downside is that all of those wetlands and all of those resource areas make some things challenging. Um, in part, it makes building uh, challenging in certain parts of our, of our town uh, with regard to high water table, um, as I learned last week as my basement <laughs> flooded. Um, but um, uh, I don't think by maintaining this pond uh, we really added to the risk to people in a res the residents of um, uh, Orchard Valley. Okay. So, you know, the reason I asked the question is just to more broadly, not specifically about markers, but but just the the sort of you know monitoring and and uh, observation we might do in much the same way you test the water at puffers to see if the E. coli levels uh, you know staying within a safe and acceptable range. Do we look at mosquito populations or other you know things I'm just sort of broadly wanting to understand sort of what the requirements are and what you you know what we find is is working for us and it's not to suggest we change any of the open water we have at all again but. it'd be a great question in the future and i can't speak for ms fetterman but i have had many conversations with her as triple e and other other uh, mosquito-borne uh, uh, illnesses have been um, raised in the valley. My understanding is that Ms. Fetterman is uh, a part of all of the networks that include regional testing of, of mosquitoes um, for the various uh, um, 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 diseases that they may carry or pass on. Um, and she is actively in those networks. All of that information is shared with her and shared with staff here uh, if we do have um, um, 
you know, dots on the, on the screen uh, geographically here in the valley. So I do know that staff, um, you know, are on top of that um, because I've been part of many of those conversations through the years. Great. So. Thank you. Um, before we leave South Amherst, just a quick update on Groff Park, another water feature, but will be chlorinated. Um, we hope we'll never have mosquitoes in it. Um, but I'm very happy to say that um, our group that included um, staff and board members, committee members uh, from LSSC, we are moving forward with the, the bidding of the Groff Park project in the next couple of weeks. Um, so again, uh, board members, uh, committee members of LSSC, uh, Barb Bills and her staff, Guilford Mooring and his staff, uh, my staff, including planners as well as uh, conservation staff, worked very hard with Berkshire Design, Mike Liu, uh, to come up with a design for both a spray park and a playground uh, and pavilions that we think will be excellent additions to Groff Park. And that should go out to bid, uh, as I said, in the next two weeks. Again, our plan is to have as much constructed before the snow flies as possible. Um, we're a little bit later in our time frame. We were a little bit uh, more deliberate, which was wonderful, and took a little more time uh, making sure that our design was solid. We had a number of community meetings, both in apartment complexes in South Amherst, as well as at Crocker Farm, where we got a lot of feedback. Um, and I think uh, we're very satisfied with that design. And again, uh, we will be under construction this fall with a goal of uh, some sort of a ribbon cutting in June of 19 uh, and having that park be open and new and fresh for next summer. So I don't have a photo of that, but um, uh, we'll use our imagination on that one. Next, um, Mill Street Bridge moving <coughs> back up north. Um, I'm sure the, uh, the, the select board is well aware that uh, the Mill Street Bridge has been removed and I had a couple of slides here showing uh, uh, showing the deconstruction of the old bridge. And you're looking, you're looking uh, on, when we stop there, you're looking uh, to the south, southeast, um, toward the, call it the difficult curve, uh, up Sand Hill Road from Mill Street. And uh, the construction crew has been working now for a couple of weeks. If we go to the next slide, there we go. Um, this is kind of, wait a minute, we took one bridge down and we have another bridge. This bridge is actually uh, put up to hold the sewer line that crosses. So that's a temporary bridge that needed to be put in place to carry the sewer line uh, across. So um, conservation staff, DPW staff uh, have been monitoring this project. It is a state project. Um, my staff person, Beth Wilson, was out there recently reviewing um, erosion control measures. You can see some of those, uh, the, the uh, orange, uh, uh, buoy type structures down in the water. Our goal is to try to keep uh, construction debris and sediment out of the Mill River uh, as much as possible during the construction. Uh, so again, um, all systems go here. You'll see um, more deconstruction happening for a couple of more weeks. And then um, we hopefully will be able to update you in early September with uh, some of the actual construction happening uh, first with the, uh, the new abutments going in. Uh, and again, for those people watching this uh, uh, um, select board meeting sometime in the future, um, a reminder that this bridge will carry one-way traffic, and then on the upstream side, on the dam side, will be a, about a 10-foot wide multi-purpose <coughs> path that will take people safely around the difficult corner up to Sand Hill Road. So uh, exciting news there. And let me see, do I have other photos, or is that it? And that's it there. Um, and then lastly, just to close with our MassWorks grant that I, I referenced earlier, I'm happy to report that, again, planning staff, uh, economic development staff, and DPW staff working together uh, submitted our MassWorks grant on Friday the 10th. Um, the total is just over $2 million in the grant. Uh, no surprise, I hope, to the select board that we are again going for um, money to improve uh, what's happening down in North Amherst, all the exciting um, um, developments in North Amherst. The goals are really threefold um, to, to improve sidewalks, bike lanes, um, the streetscape 
uh, on Route 63 and in the Village Center close to uh, the North Amherst Library uh, to promote more efficient transportation to UMass, to and from UMass, and to create a civic core, a civic space uh, between and among the library, <coughs> school functions, and the recreation field, the uh, so-called cow field. Um, this is our third time applying. We've done extensive outreach to the state. Uh, Mr. Bockelman, uh, uh, in various visits from Jay Ash and the governor and other uh, state representatives um, uh, from state government, we have made the case that we think this is a very strong application this year. We think it goes very well with what is happening with the Beacon Project, the redevelopment there of both housing, affordable housing, and commercial and retail space. So we, uh, we feel good that the application is in, is in and uh, we received a lot of support letters from uh, the chamber, from UMass, and a number of other entities that supported the, the project. So about just over $2 million and uh, we will keep you posted and hopefully we'll have positive feedback in the, the weeks to come. So I think I'll stop there and take questions. Ms. Kruger, she was quick. <laughs> I was first. Um, so I'm glad that went in again. I think it's important. I think we sh it should be granted. Um, my support letters are great, but um, I think it's often in the political arena that we either get or don't get these some of these grants. And I'm wondering um, our role as select board, how we can use some of those political um, levers to help advance this. We're a little bit handicapped because our delegation is changing but I'm wondering if there's a role for us, uh, you know, beyond a letter, but to do some of that behind the scenes because I, I, I feel like a, a real aggressive lobbying on this, if there's a role for us in that, that that might make the difference. I guess I'd defer to Mr. Bockelman. We certainly have, he has done some of that, and I guess I would defer to Mr. Bockelman and the chair to perhaps have a conversation about that. And through the chair, you all take whatever action you mm -hmm. deem is appropriate in like terms to keep of that. keep it up there on our yes. radar. Absolutely. Yeah. Is the design, the, the detailed design, still a matter that's being worked on or is a future item? Uh, it is. Um, we, left, uh, we left open uh, the specific nature of the design. Um, you all recall that we referred to concept D, which was bringing Sunderland Road over to the north of the North Amherst Library to meet Route 63. We are still promoting in the grant uh, that general concept, um, but we also wanted to focus on improvements to the four-way intersection at um, Meadow and Pine. So in terms of the specificity, is this a signalized intersection or is this a roundabout intersection? We were not specific on that. We um, were, were upfront in the grant application that there still needed to be some more process and some more uh, discussion and, and engineering work around that, that, uh, that part of the grant. Yes, um, because there are two things uh, just point out for everybody, and that is that uh, one of the heaviest backups is eastbound on Meadow Street, P getting hung up by people making a left turn to go north towards the y, what's now a Y intersection. The other problem that's been in there, and this is because I have a lot of contact with staff at the North Amherst Library, mm -hmm. is that there used to be a crosswalk, and I've talked about this with Mr. Bockelman, from uh, roughly where the church is over to the library and it was removed at the time of the paving. There is no crosswalk marked on the street and I'm told because it was a state project and it did not meet state standards, it couldn't be replaced. Well, we're now putting more traffic if this under this plan on that street and we still don't have a, um, and if we don't have a crosswalk for um, pedestrians to safely access the library um, from the side where there's a street crossing. I think that it's a problem and needs to be attended to. We're way out of our realm here. <laughs> I, way. Just if I, could, I know that Mr. Bockelman is aware, as, as is Mr. Mooring, about the crosswalk. 
clearly, if we're successful in getting the grant, all of the pedestrian, bicycle, traffic issues will be addressed as part of a, a master streetscape design for that intersection, including near the church, uh, the former Watroba store, the, the, the parish center, and the library, and, and nor points north. So I think to Mr. Steinberg's concern, um, we none of us want to end up with a design that is not safe, provide safe crossing for pedestrians and cyclists in that area. Um, having grown up in North Amherst, I am very aware of when you begin to go down that hill north on 63, the natural inclination is to accelerate. Mm -hmm. And that is right where that crosswalk used to be. Wouldn't be where it so was. So we will certainly address that. Again, we're, 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 we're uh, hopeful that uh, third time's a charm with this grant. Mr. Wall. Actually, I was going to say, I move that we add use of color photographs and town manager reports to the <laughs> FY19 performance goals. But <laughs> that was very, actually very helpful to see pictures of things. Uh, but just one thing, could you update, for the sake of the viewing public in particular, uh, update us on the North Common and public process? Sure, I'll do. Coming up in the near future. Yeah, I'll do the best I can. Um, I was away part of last week, and, and there were a number of emails um, kind of moving forward. So um, as you know, and, and most of the public knows, uh, we, ha we hired earlier this year, we hired Weston and Samson to assist us with uh, the design of the North Common. Um, the design team uh, is composed uh, first and foremost by members of the Historical Commission, the LSSC Commission. Funding came from, through CPA, through town meeting, CPA dollars from recreation and open space, as well as historic preservation. Those committee members uh, and board members are supported by town staff from planning, uh, uh, LSSC, and DPW. So it's, it's a fairly large group. It's a very engaged group. I've been to most of their meetings. Uh, it's, it's a spirited group, and um, they don't all agree on, on everything, which is really uh, kind of fun and exciting. Mr. Bockelman has made many of the meetings. Um, so uh, Weston and Sampson have been moving forward with conceptual designs. Um, I don't have the dates, exact dates, uh, memorized at this point, but our goal is to bring the select board, um, because this project is in the public way, the ultimate design needs approval from the select board. Our goal is to bring some initial, at least three concepts to you um, uh, in what I understand is early September. So it may be your first meeting in September, and again, I don't have the dates uh, memorized. I believe it's September 5th. This is our first meeting. Yeah. This is our first meeting. I don't know if you have um, So we are going to try to bring concepts to you for feedback, just initial feedback, not approval, obviously, uh, in one meeting uh, at uh, your, your September 5th meeting. There is a public meeting being held prior to that, the week prior, in the last week of August, which would be a public forum where we will bring together the team, the volunteer members of, of committees and boards and staff, and invite the public to view the conceptual plans at that stage. So um, again, in terms of broader timeline, That's what I was looking for, really. well, I, I did just want to give a, a sense of this would be something that we would like to complete the design this fall go out to bid in the winter of 19 with a construction season, uh, hopefully in May after uh, college and university graduation. Okay. So. Thank you. Ms. Any Brooke. other questions? Yes, North questions. South, you had so many nice pictures, so we'll just focus on North questions. Um, in regards to the North Common, one of the things we talked about at the previous public forum, and I know it isn't that there's just been one, there have been several over the years, and so fully acknowledging that, but in terms of in its current iteration um, process, we had a meeting, and one of the things that was discussed at that meeting, very um, there was only maybe one or maybe two historical commission members there, and one or two, LS, actually more LSSC commission members there, 
And one of the things we talked about is that there's only so many times you can, you know, based on the money that you're paying, that you have consultants come in and explain things to people. And so one of the conversations that took place in this room when we were talking about that is that we couldn't expect them to go and give the whole show to a historical commission meeting, to a leisure services commission meeting, to a select board meeting, even though eventually it was coming to us. And to, so how to make that clear to people that they needed to participate. And something you just said is what reminded me of that, which is I think you indicated that we were specifically encouraging those committee members to come to that public forum as well. And I know that's difficult for people because that's in fact the night of the first day celebration, which I've just been telling people, you just walk right over here, you're over there on the common, it's perfect. It's Tuesday the 28th. And I believe it starts, at s seems like it starts a little early. It, nope, it starts at seven. First day runs from 5 to 6.30, and the North Common starts at 7. And so the idea being that, just to be clear, from a staffing standpoint in terms of getting it out to us, like I said, there was almost no representation from the Historic Commission at that meeting, and maybe they felt fine about stuff they saw at their own meetings, but it sounds like we, need, we want to try and get as many people as we can to that meeting on the 28th as well. We're happy to do that, and that's a good reminder. I will say that there have been numerous staff meeting or staff. There have been numerous design team meetings where historical commission, commission members been have present. been present and good. very vocal and very engaged. But no, I appreciate the the reminder that uh, how do we engage the entire historical commission without having to make Yet numerous presentations? We've been pretty successful, I will say, with the with the. Um, uh, Gruff Park uh, by not requiring the designer to go to every meeting. Uh, Barb Bills, Director Bills, uh, or myself have gone to individual LSSC meetings and made presentations on where we are with the concepts. Um, so you're right, we can't have the designer going to endless uh, committee meetings, but hitting those important ones, whether it's a public forum or coming before you uh, with the design concepts are very important. So. We will make every effort to make sure the Historical Commission feels invited and welcomed at that meeting, and if necessary, town staff will go to their meeting in that period and, and try to make a, a special presentation to them. Um, but I can talk to the chair about that. That'd be super, because I think there was a placard and there was one Historical Commission. <laughs> it's like, here I am up here in the front of the room by myself. <laughs> Maybe yeah, there were two. I think we've, it we've was come a, little, a long way yeah. since then. I That's know. terrific. Thank you. And then um, along those lines, uh, completely just north, but not North Common, but North Amherst, um, I appreciated the clarity you were adding to the idea about the design around the four-way intersection, so to speak, and the actual um, plan, concept D, that brings that road in because it's actually two very separate things, right? One could be signalized, one could have a roundabout, et cetera, because one of the things that as the council election unfolds is North Amherst has decided that they wanna talk about that at a meeting on Sunday. And so people who are being invited to that particular meeting or talking about it on Sunday. And I wanted to be clearer before I got there as to how far along those plans are and where people can continue to feed in. I do, I am hoping it's not intended, because I'm not in charge of the agenda, that it's not intended to be brainstorming sessions since we've already been down a whole lot of these conversations before. But to be accurate in my representation when it comes up when people do start just brainstorming from scratch that in fact concept d has been walked through numerous forums that we are in fact you know looking at this point about having that space be green space basically between the school and the library that's a plan at this point that's not just like oh maybe we'll do it or maybe we won't that's pretty solid that we're going to do that, right? I think I think the civic core is a very solid concept. There because we be had it nuances, through numerous steps. Uh, based on what the arc of Sunderland Road looks like coming from the north and making its way east through 63. So 
you know, those kinds of details have right. not been worked out. I do want to emphasize to the public and to, to the board tonight, if we're successful in getting the grant, we're looking at both the four-way and the other. Whether, you know, whether we will, we, we certainly would not for $2 million have the funding to do everything for both intersections. And to Mr. Steinberg's uh, point about the back up going east from Meadow Street and taking a left, that is a very left north mm -hmm. on 63 or Sunderland Road at this point. That is a very challenging, um, uh, challenging area there because the right of way is rather narrow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Mr. Bockelman has asked me to attend the forum on the 19th to answer questions. So I plan to be there. Great. Um, thank you. That'll be helpful. And thank you. So I don't have to answer those. So <laughs> thank you. And I will be there. <laughs> and um, because again, just to emphasize for the listening public, we've been doing this for years. We've been having these kind of, we've had huge turnout at the Survival Center talking about that plan. This is not like a new thing or something that staff just made up on the back of an envelope. This has been through a lot of process up until this point. One of the meetings I think was one of the largest I've attended. There was over 80 people. Exactly. Yeah. There. Oh no, there was this, this one was at the Survival, survival Center. Survival Center, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. There was more than one yeah, and right. it was amazing people. how yeah. many people yeah. we turned out. Mm -hmm. When, what's the, and I, you'll, so you can practice answering this for Sunday. What's the time frame on the MassWorks grant in terms of them telling us back? This is a fairly quick turnaround as it I It is, I mean, I, I think it's October, November, okay. depending on, you know, the state takes the time it needs. And I'm sure the response to this will be very robust the response overall to the grant right. application in terms of the number of, of, of submittals that I get. So just then to follow up on the crosswalk issue, so that's really unfortunate where we are with that right now in terms of, I totally get, you know, state said this, but, but it's like not okay to expect people to walk all the way up to the light from the convenience store before they cross over the library. Like that's not how humans work. And so we're gonna get this grant. But if we didn't, by some horrible twist of fate, it feels like we'd have to do something to get people from Riverglade over to the library in terms of somebody needs to be looking at that. I, I yes, think, but I think that's, we had it before. Can, can I just say, I think we're really, I mean, I'm getting tired. Doing engineering and design discussion in this meeting, I, I just, I don't so like it. It's a crosswalk to get humans from I, one place to the other. I don't care how we do it. The need is identified, but I think to start to brainstorm how and why the, this is technical and it's engineering and it's state traffic law or whatever it's called, I just think it's not productive for us to use our time, maybe because I'm getting tired, but I just think, yes, there's a safety issue there, has to be addressed, but I don't think we, it, it's useful for us to talk about how to redesign that stuff now. I'm not I'd trying happy, to redesign it. No, I, I'd be happy to, to bring this again to Mr. Bockelman's attention with Mr. Mooring. Um, I will say that even if we were to get the grant, it would be we, a are, we are a couple of years yeah. away from actually implementation. So yeah. we will revisit this issue of the safety at the library. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ms. Wall. Okay, I've got a 10 second question this time. Um, I know that the North Square is talking about completion in summer of 2019. According to the signs they have posted there, for example, do we have a sense of what that actually means in terms of months or season? Could you repeat that? I thought there was a, that, that yeah. they're talking about North Square things getting done by the end of sometime next summer. Do you have a sense of when that would be? I don't Speaking have of North specific, Amherst development. I see. Uh, dates. I think it would be a good question that I could research through Mr. Mora, Ms. Uh, Ms. Brestrup, and we could get back to you through Mr. Bockelman. Okay. Are there other questions for Mr. Zomek? If not, then I think we'll um, go into select board member reports. So, does anyone have a select board member report? I'm tired, Mr. Steinberg, talk about that. <laughs> Here's your prompt. Speak. Why don't you go ahead? Hey, this beautiful handout. Um, 
Mr. Steinberg and I were fortunate to be able to make the time to attend a roundtable discussion that was part of a whole um, series of discussions that Congressman McGovern <coughs> was going around in Worcester area and this area. It was wonderful. Was that the middle school? Pardon me? I know. I'm like, why haven't you brought this up? Um, <laughs> the middle school as well. We got a couple pictures. Um, and then we also, a couple of us were able to go also over to Mill River to see the Baby Burke truck there actually feeding kids, which was wonderful because the kids see the Baby Burke truck at UMass events and football games and that sort of thing. But to see that um, it's a very different feeling, as somebody pointed out, than when they were a child lining up for government cheese um, versus getting to go to the Baby Burke and get some and get lunch. So um, McGovern really appreciated and he also offered to help facilitate any conversations that might need to take place between the various groups, Project Bread, et cetera, who are trying to make this work at different locations, different apartment complexes, et cetera, because apparently, sadly, not all the apartment complexes are quite as welcoming as they might be and others are incredibly welcoming. So um, he offered to help facilitate any difficulties we might be having with that, but it's been great partnership with the schools, which have a new third service director and also leisure services and like just a lot of people working together really effectively. It's very encouraging. Thank you. Other member reports, Mr. Wall? I never do these things because it's too late and we're too tired, but <laughs> just, just very briefly again, Mr. Zomek did a very nice report on the dog park task force and he gets a lot really the credit for getting us as far, he and Mr. Pistrang as we did and it's really wonderful. Uh, just briefly, um, Public arts has been energetic, as is its custom. They were trying, for example, to uh, push the need for public art in private developments uh, before the planning board of the groups there have been talking about public sculpture. The practical piece of news is that, um, again, they're trying to talk to the developers who are doing the projects now, but in the short term that they've extended the deadline for the painting of the electric utility boxes. Uh, and there are leaflets downstairs, and it's on the website. So that's, I believe, September 30th is the deadline now. Uh, so if you have brilliant artistic plans, here's your chance. And then uh, on Design Review Board has had some interesting meetings, one very turbulent discussing, for example, the Spring Street construction, and one less turbulent, but resulting in a vote, a strong negative vote regarding that design, which has been revised. Um, so just because, as you may have heard, there's been some public interest or interest in or dissatisfaction with those designs. Uh, you know, So part of the concern about Spring Street had to do with uh, an issue that was not really within the scope of the design review board, the conversion of the uh, multi-unit apartments to studios uh, in the design. And that was explained by the developers on the grounds that based on previous experience, these things, you know, they aren't renting to families. People who want to live downtown don't usually have uh, two kids and a dog. So that was explained as a market thing. There was some dissatisfaction in general also about the change of use, the mixed use. There had been talk about an art gallery, perhaps for Amherst College Museum, objects that's becoming a coffee house instead, a coffee shop on the ground floor, some satisfaction with the landscape design that was changed, dissatisfaction with parking being removed, uh, and so forth. And then general questions, uh, some of which are purely subjective aesthetics about what fits in and what doesn't fit in. Uh, for what it's worth, the planning director, Ms. Brestrup, thought that the revised plans were a better match for the neighborhood than the original one. But just that these issues are coming up in different places. Um, Again, that one was within the scope of the body. It was the, there was public comment, but then the body made its own judgment uh, about at least three things that were pertinent to its, its charge. And I think I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you. Ms. Kruger. Thank you, Mr. Wald, for um, explaining some of the thinking behind the permitting for the Spring Street projects. And so again, this is not the permitting, it's just the advisory. I mean, the, yeah, yeah. But the, the thinking about that site and that building, because we heard earlier today some um, very er erroneous and inflammatory accusations. And I think often um, people don't understand what the rules are and what the role of the different boards are. And actually, they, the boards themselves do understand the regulations they're there to administer or the recommendations they're there to deliver. And that doesn't mean that the results please everyone, but I think that the process is open, transparent, and totally honest. So um, I think any opportunity to help people understand or educate people about what actually happens um, in approving and making recommendations about you know, significant new development is important. So I thank you for that. Yes. 
I could just echo that since I have served on design review board in the past. You know, and part of the thing is these are advisory bodies like historical commission. I've been on both, and they carry some weight. But at a certain point, a lot of things are done by right. You're allowed, you know, the certain height or the certain setback and so forth. And so what you can do is you can say the extent to which you think something fits into the context or doesn't. And also, I should say, at least in design review, it's been a very collegial pro. You know, people sometimes are scared because we for town boards about permitting. And this is not permitting; it's advisory. But it's usually a very friendly conversation. You know, we think about this. What about this? Can you do this? You know, at some point they say, no, I can't. You know, here's where I'm done. But I mean, particular design review board has been a very. Uh, I, I wasn't at the planning board meeting, so I can't comment on what happened there. But design review has been always very constructive, collegial, and, and positive in trying to work with developers and homeowners to get a result and business people that that satisfies the largest number. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Other member reports? Yes. Since the town manager is not here, and I didn't know if this was going to be it, did you want to mention the marijuana documents, just that we have them? So I didn't know whether or not you or Ms. Kruger wanted to bring that up, since you are most intimately familiar with the, uh, with the topic, but I would be happy to hear about them if you want to offer some suggestion about them. I found one grammatical sort of typo, but that was <laughs> pretty sad. It's too bad, since it already went somewhere, didn't it? There's a place um, where an is and a will be are right next to each other, and it's got to be one or the other, but not both. But. Is it in fact in finished form already so the comments are therefore not yes. helpful? Yeah, it was, well, it was time sensitive, but you might want to hear the update. Well, okay, so I'm a little confused because I didn't look at this as carefully as I might have because, gosh, I'd looked at it 50 times already. But what I didn't notice until just now is that the process update is in here, and so if it's got a typo in it, oh well but the actual part that starts guidance for which is the part that would get distributed toward potential applicants if that has any typos in it we would want to make sure we definitely fix those because that's going to get tell you. sent out to people h2 town review team meeting the purpose of the of this meeting is will be for town review team to ask detailed questions so it's well, look at that yeah, that's the only one I saw. That's the only thing I saw in, in uh, is her slide post. So, so Mr. Zomak can take that back to Mr. Kravitz so that the, of the next the document. One. Keep going. Oh, like oh, two that are similar, end. but okay. this one. On page two of that. Gotcha. Right. Here we go. Right. So this is will be, yeah. yeah, that got to be tidied up. Just so that, you know, the applicants don't think we're crazy. But the other thing I thought would be in here that isn't in here is the really excellent, you know, because, of course, we all contributed to it. Um, but Mr. Kravitz did a huge amount of work associated with the uh, feedback that we gave associated with host community agreements. So that should be in our next packet, just so everybody has it. To the CCC. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's what I meant. Yeah, that was not in here. That so, should be provided to us. So if somebody could, if we could just put it in the front, we don't have to do anything with it on the agenda on Monday because we got lots else to do. But everybody should have a copy of it. So maybe just to give a little context, if people are wondering, uh, who are watching this, what we're what we're what we're doing. We've had a couple of meetings, and the um, Cannabis Control Commission um, asked communities for input on their host community um, guidance document, and also they had a document and I can't remember which, which one was when, around um, different, uh, addressing the social equity concerns and, and um, how communities could do that. And so we've had a couple of meetings over the summer and also here at the select board we discussed this and we talked about a way that the town manager um, with consultation with staff and perhaps other local officials could um, review um, some uh, recreational marijuana site applications um, and, and kind of choose or rate which ones would be the ones to get um, host community agreements and then in six months maybe do that again because um, we have going up to the eight these possibilities but we wanted to sort of choose wisely among what was out there not just first come first serve so what I think what you have here is um, staff's attempt to address the feedback we gave in our meeting about how to do that working with the manager um, what would be in the host community agreement which is really the ticket they need 
to go to the Cannabis Control Commission for their license review. So um, how to kind of be somewhat of a gatekeeper in a fair manner of people interested in opening the retail sites. There's other uses that need host community agreements like the testing lab and cultivation. That's not gonna be subject to this um, kind of comparative review process that we're right. kind of inventing. Right. So is that, does that meet what you, is that accurate, Ms. Brewer? I think that is roughly accurate. I think if you look at the end of the first document at the bottom of page six, you'll see the anticipated timeline for recreational marijuana retail establishments. That's the thing we put the limit of eight on. That's the one everybody's excited about because that's where they get to buy their adult use marijuana. Um, the other proposed process that's just below that is for basically everything else that isn't retail. So because we were thinking, hey, we'd be a great location for a testing lab given the UMass, Amherst, Hampshire connection, et cetera. But, and so that would be, although it still needs host community agreement, it would not be subjected to this complex process that we feel like does reflect various concerns brought to the table, various tables over the last couple times. The comments were due to, this is our own process. The comments about the host community agreement were due back to the CPCC last Monday, and they talked about them on Thursday, and they're going to reissue them. And so we will see those, and I believe we got an email. We, I think we all got copied on that email from Mr. Kravitz, but maybe not, because Mass Municipal Association also weighed in, and KP Law also weighed in when they asked for comments. Apparently, they only got about 30 sets of comments, so given that KBLA, MMA, and Amherst all weighed in, we're, we're in good company. Um, they also asked at the same time for comments about the social equity guidance to municipalities because they have their own plans, and then how, well, how could communities deal with that? Ms. Kruger and I talked about that when we were part of the Connecting Point show um, a couple of weeks ago associated with that, and it turned out that the guidance they did on uh, equity as so many things with marijuana, we're like ready for the graduate level course and they're still putting out guidance for the Primer 101 course or maybe remedial section for towns who just haven't wanted to deal with this at all yet. And so it's about at the last of six or eight pages of, the, of their draft guidance on social equity that it actually meant something to because we'd already done all the other steps. Right. So we're, you know, we're still trying to build this plane as we're flying it kind of deal. Right. But we, you may see new guidance come out associated with municipalities, host community agreements, and then also with trying to incorporate social equity. We didn't bother trying to turn in comments on the social equity thing, because like I said, we had the other focus and it was a very short turnaround time. So you should see that document that Mr. Kravitz finished that got into them on time in our next packet, just so we all have a copy of it, so then you understand better when they reissue it how we got to where we got to, okay. because I'm not sure how quickly they'll reissue it given some of the legal questions that KP Law raised, actually. I think what, if I could add, I think what you have tonight is really directly germane to this board and the work we, we did um, with Mr. Kravitz and Mr. Bockelman at a previous meeting. And um, if I were right. a betting person, I'd say once we, we start doing this and it's you know finalized, Which, I, I bet a lot of communities are gonna start copying this. This will be a way to do it that because there's not a lot of so we started stuff out there. accepting applications last week. Well, right, but this. just right, but we haven't made decisions yet. So I'm just saying of interest, we might not be changing it. But I, I think we're again kind of in a lead. Um, Worcester had a selection process. We looked at theirs, but. And I wonder if you might make a note, Mr. Slaughter, then to ask the town manager not on the 20th because we'll be focused on the evaluation, but at a subsequent meeting to update us on whether or not we ended up following this timeline. If we did begin accepting applications last week and if we are indeed closing the application period on election day. Something's changed. My question on there was when I was saying is this out in there for really a done deal, we can't really comment on it. Um, the one thing that I was curious about is why a decision was made to ask um, 
applicants about how they're screening um, employees for prior for violations of one set of prior laws relating to marijuana uh, related violations and not asking for other kinds of criminal record or problems it, it just wasn't computing to me as to why that one was being picked out because if the goal is, is that we don't want to penalize people for um, irrelevant uh, kinds of criminal things, which is something I was always sensitive to in legal aid work where um, Corey was knocking people out of jobs and it, um, the smallest thing. I mean, it seems that marijuana violations sometimes are very small. So we specifically called out the things that were called out in the social equity program as being basically positive points towards your social equity credibility if you've had one of these minor violations. The Corey check is still a process that will take place, but the things we were talking about were, you know, if you were related to somebody that something bad happened to associated with a minor offense or you yourself had a minor offense or you live in this area, those are all social equity considerations. So we did not get into the in this pro in this part of the process we did not get into what the Corey check would look like because that's just part of the other process this is the giving you credit for a minor violation that might have disqualified you from something else in life but would not in, it would in fact help you toward this application it gives you bonus points so to speak although there are no points same, same issue that you brought up but it's just kind of turned around <laughs> yeah. thank, thank you for the clarification yeah, that's helpful so I have a small report. Um, the Amherst Mun for Municipal Affordable Housing Trust met. Uh, we're working through a couple of things. Uh, I've mentioned this to you before. It's still in process about a policy that uh, the trust is hopeful that multiple bodies will engage in and participate in and adopt. So like the planning board will, will now be the town council, not the select board, because it won't get here before we leave. And it would probably be inappropriate if we, even if it did. Um, so that's one piece of work. Another piece of work that we've been uh, chipping away at is a, is kind of an application process. Um, and so we've been looking at sort of what's our criteria for selection, what are the things that, you know, count more or less relative to sort of building out money for projects and that sort of thing. Um, and so we've been, been working through that. It's pretty close to finished as well. Um, you know, targets for cost per unit, uh, things of that nature. Um, so those are the two big things that are going on. The third thing that I want to mention to you, and I have a copy of uh, a sample letter. Um, we're going to apply to uh, CHAPA, which is the Citizens Housing Advocacy and Planning Association for a grant, uh, which is due, I think the application is actually due like this Friday. And so uh, a letter of support from us as an organization or from me personally as the chair, which was the suggestion of uh, the chair of the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, so if you, and it basically says, the select board and the trust have gotten along swell and that we really support these things that you want to get grant money for. I have a sample letter here if you guys want to take a moment and read through it and see if there's anything that, that sort of jumps out at you. We put it, of course, on letterhead. And I think there's extra copy. I'll just, here, I'll just pass Citizen it Citizen Housing and Planning Association. Right. I, no, I, I wasn't sure. I, I read what was in here. It's a, so it's housing and Okay, so we'll correct that before. Right. So if there's anything in this letter, if you want to take a moment to read through it. came to me this afternoon, so I've only read it through once myself.
just a form. This really should be, if it's from the select board, it really should be addressed to Chapa, not to Mr. Hornick. I wondered about that as I well. Just, this, that's just not the right form. Right. Um, I can do that. The, the Dear John letter part uh, <laughs> right. would be to the director, to um, Rachel Keller. To Keller? You have to look it up online, but I would That's write fine. it to the, the director. She'll send it to the person running this program. No. Right. And then right. he can get a copy of, you know, CC, John right. Hornick, blah, blah, blah. Um, Any content changes or additions? We have a day or two, but literally a day or two. No, I mean, I I think it's one through four, if that's the things that... That's really gonna, essentially yeah. what's on the grant application? Right, I, yeah. I, I saw that an, uh, announcement go out for... Right. Building support. Right. Yes? I think it would be good since really all most of this is is a reiteration of what the application form says rather than mm -hmm. <laughs> anything we think. Um, basically, we just have one sentence that we're supportive of expanding access. So rather than just saying that, maybe you could pull a sentence, maybe from the town manager's uh, year-end report about the tax increment financing thing we did with Beacon. We, 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 need, we need to take credit for first in the Commonwealth for doing that, not just, yeah, we like affordable housing, except when it's complicated. So, um, so we need to give an example. Yeah. I bet Ms. Kruger could come up with something else off the top of her head too. Yeah, I think that one would be especially good. I mean, yes. I did not write it today. I received it today, but I did not write it today. Just turn it around a little to be our. Yep. Okay, I can add that. I will, um, so I'll make those edits perhaps tomorrow night and circulate them out for be satisfied if Ms. Kruger saw it just because if she's dealt with this agency before, she might know what they like to hear. I'm happy to look at it if there's time to do that, and I, if you want me to. Okay, I will do that. I'll run it by at least one of you <laughs> before I send it out. And then once it's sent, if you would include it in our packet. Absolutely. Absolutely. I got nothing else to do. Okay, so that's the only report that I can think of at this moment. So I think we have exhausted ourselves as well as our agenda. So <laughs> unless there's something adjourned. else, thank you. Is there a second? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And we are adjourned at 10.14 p.m. Thank you all and thank you, Amherst Media, for being here. <laughs>